Before we start this chapter, we shall have a look into few keywords so that you pay more attention to them when they come across. At the end of this chapter, you shall be in a position to remember these keywords. These are the keywords. Please read them on your own, and whenever they appear during the lecture, please pay more attention. In this lecture, we are going to understand what is testing. We have two learning objectives under this topic. First objective is identify typical objectives of testing, and it is marked as K1. That means questions will be direct and you need to remember each point in it. Second objective is differentiate testing from debugging. It is marked as K2. That means you need to understand this topic. But before we start with these objectives, we shall understand what is testing. In this syllabus, we need to understand testing in the context of software. That means we will discuss only software testing, not hardware testing or electrical testing. So, what is software testing? Software testing is a way to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Let's understand this. Once the developer develops software, the software is not directly given to the user. Before giving it to the user, the software undergoes a process to find out the defects and risks associated with software. And this process is called testing. So, by finding defects, we increase the quality of the software and reduce the risk associated with the software. Now, let's see some applications of software. First example is business application, and second one is customer products. Examples of business application are when you go to an airport to book your ticket or when you go to a supermarket to buy items, or when you are working in the office. Software is all around us. And some examples of customer products are washing machines, mobile phones, or coffee makers. They all contain software within them. What is your expectation from this software? The software will work whenever we use it. To ensure this, Testing of software is required. What happens if the software does not work correctly? Such software is called faulty software. And a faulty software can result in loss of money, time, reputation, or in extreme cases, can result in injury or death. Now let's see some real-time examples to understand this. This news was in the market that one particular car company recalled 2,000 of its cars due to an issue with the front passenger airbag. Once such news hits the market, the share value of the company goes down and results in huge loss of money. Once these cars are in the garage, they undergo repair and at the same time the company has to do damage control. All this takes lots of effort and time. Let's see an example of loss of reputation. In 2014, there was a breach in the security aspect of eBay software. That means the software was not working as according to the expectations, and if such news comes out, it results in loss of reputation. Sometimes the defect can also result in injury or death. For example, if the airbag system doesn't work as expected. These were the four impacts of faulty software. 
loss of money, time, reputation, and injury or death. Now we will see some of the misconceptions about testing. First misconception is that testing only consists of running test cases, which is completely wrong, as testing is a process and consists of many activities that are listed here. It consists of test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. We will discuss each of these activities in detail in our future lectures, but for the time being, you need to remember these activities in the same order as listed here. Second misconception is that testing only involves the execution of the component or system being tested. This is also false, as testing consists of both dynamic and static testing. In dynamic testing, a code is executed, whereas in static testing, a code is not executed. We will provide a detailed lecture on this topic. For the time being, just remember that testing consists of dynamic and static testing techniques. The last misconception which we are going to discuss in this lecture is that testing focuses entirely on verification of requirements. This is also false, as testing focuses on both verification and validation of the requirements. Verification means, are we building product right? Whereas validation means to check if we built the right product. Again, I will provide detailed lecture to explain difference between both. As of now, remember testing focuses on verification and validation of the requirements. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look at the important points. Testing is done to assess the quality of the software and to reduce the risk of software failure in operation. Next point is that faulty software can result in loss of money, time, reputation, and injury or death. Testing is a process which consists of different activities such as test planning, test monitoring, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Testing consists of static and dynamic testing and consists of verification and validation processes. All these important points are available as a resource and attached with this video. Now we are going to discuss dynamic testing versus static testing. The first point of difference is, static testing is done without execution of code, whereas in dynamic testing, we are executing the code. Let's try to illustrate this with an example. Let us say that we have a customer requirement that states, window shall move up when the up button is pressed and shall move down when the down button is pressed. To fulfill this requirement, you have to write a code for it. Now, suppose a developer has written this particular code. This is a function where he's trying to implement the customer's requirement. When button is pressed, if button up, then move up, otherwise move down. Our task as a tester is to check whether this piece of code is satisfying the requirement or not, and this type of testing is known as static testing. So let's try to test this particular code. Here, it's saying that if up button is pressed, then move up, but if up button is not pressed, then move down. If you execute this code, then the window will never stop moving. It will move up if you press the up button, but the moment you release the button, it will keep on moving down. This means that this code is failing to fulfill the requirement. 
So this is how we find defects through static testing. So why do we call this static? Because when I was performing this test, this code was not moving. It was in one place. This is why this type of testing is called static testing. So that's it for static testing. Now moving on to the dynamic part. Dynamic testing requires you to study the behavior. Here, if you press the down button, then the window moves down. You aren't bothered about the code or how it is written. When you press the up button, window will move up. And when you press the down button, it will slide down. Here, what you need to remember is static testing is carried out without the execution of code, while dynamic testing requires execution of code. Now, let's move to point two in their difference. Static testing is conducted in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is performed in the validation stage. Let's find out what they mean by verification stage and validation stage. So here we have the life cycle of a software development activity. First, you will have a user requirement. Next, a system requirement. Then, a global requirement. Then, you will have a detailed design. Once you have this design, then you can start writing the code. Now, static testing is done in the early stage, when we only have the document. As you can see, we don't have the code here. And if we don't have a code, we can't run a software. When we have only documents, then we can only perform a static testing. We can carry out a verification. We can't run the code. So these are the two stages. The first part is for static testing. But once the code is ready, you can perform the dynamic testing. Because now you can run the code. This is why static testing is done in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is done in the validation stage. So once you have the code available, you can perform the dynamic testing. Otherwise, it's not possible. Now, we move to the third difference. Static testing is cost-effective, whereas dynamic testing is less cost-effective. Let's try to understand this. As we saw in this diagram, let's assume you were in the requirements stage and you found defect here. Since you found the defect in the same stage, cost to fix the defect is less. But during dynamic testing, you are all the way over here. And if you find fault here, and after analysis you found the requirement is wrong, then you have to change all these documents. This will require more people to solve problems, and cost to fix defect will increase. So this is the reason we said that static testing is cost-effective, while dynamic testing is less cost-effective. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. The first point is, static testing is conducted without execution of code. Dynamic testing requires execution of code. The second point is, static testing is performed in the verification stage, whereas dynamic testing is performed in the validation stage. The third point is, Static testing is cost-effective, while dynamic testing is less cost-effective. There is a fourth point about examples that I want to add here. Static testing examples are walkthroughs and code reviews, whereas with dynamic testing you have to perform functional or non-functional tests. This was the summary of what we covered in this video. See you next time! In this lecture, we are going to see the objective of testing.
let's have a look into the first objective of this syllabus. Just remember, you need to know these objectives as it is as question will come directly from this topic since it is marked as K1. Before we jump to the objectives, you must know these important terms which we are going to use in this lecture. We should know what is the meaning of work product and test item. Work product means output. Let's understand this. These are the steps followed during development of software in an organization. First step is to get user requirement. Then we develop system requirement. Then comes the global design. Next is detailed design. And the last step is implementation where software is developed. When we say work product, in the system requirement stage, the output is system requirement. In the global design and detailed design stage, output is design document. And in the implementation stage, output is code. So keep in mind, work product means output. Test item, which is also known as test object, is any document or component or system which is under test. Let's see the same example to understand this. In the requirement stage, requirement is work product. If this has to be reviewed, then requirement is referred to as test item. Similarly, if we are in implementation stage output of this stage is code. And if we want to perform testing on it, then code is out test item here. So output of the stage is called work product. And if testing is performed on it, then it is called test item. So we can say any document or component or system which is under test is called test item. This is the first objective. To evaluate work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code. We already know work product means output, and output of the requirement stage is requirement document, where all the requirements are mentioned. Now, as per the first objective, we have to evaluate this work product. Let's see an example to understand this. Suppose this is the customer requirement. For web page, when the login details are given, the next page shall load in few milliseconds. And if login details are not correct, then show a pop-up. But if you look carefully, this requirement is not complete. There are open points. First, how much time? Second, which page will load next? Third, what is the pop-up content? These are the questions which need clarification. So this is why it is necessary to evaluate work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code. Second objective states, to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. Let's understand this. We already know this requirement. Now, we need to see if these requirements are fulfilled in the engineering requirement. After analyzing the customer requirement and asking question, we finally have the engineering requirement, which includes the following points. First, login is correct, go to next page. Second, next page shall load in 500 milliseconds. Third, Next page shall contain the personal information. Fourth, if the login detail is not correct, pop-up shall appear. Five, pop-up message, password or user ID is incorrect. Like this, in each stage, we have to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. Third objective is, to validate whether the test object is complete and works as the users and other stakeholders expect, test object means object under test, and it is defined as the component or system to be tested. When you are in requirement stage, requirement is your test object, and in design stage, 
Design is your test object. And at the implementation stage, Code is your test object. Now let's continue with our example. As per third objective, we need to provide input to the test object and check the output if it fulfills the stakeholder's requirement. That means once the software is ready, we need to execute it to see if it's fulfilling the customer's requirement. Since here we are executing the code, so this comes under validation. So third objective is to validate whether the test object is complete and works as the users and other stakeholders expect. Fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. Let's understand this. Suppose we are in the requirement stage, then requirement is our test object. And if we clarify our requirement in this stage itself, instead of clarifying it during the implementation stage, then we can build confidence in our requirement and finally in our product. That is why fourth objective is to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object. Now let's discuss objectives five and six together. Objective five is to prevent defects and objective six is to find failure and defects. Let's understand these two objectives. If you find defects in the requirement stage, you prevent these defects to go to the next stage. Now the sixth objective comes into picture. We need to find the defects or failure in the same stage in which they are tested. Otherwise, defect will travel to the next stage and it will be more costly to fix. This is one of the important objectives of testing to prevent defects, to find failure and defects. The seventh objective is to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object. When we find defects, it's not necessary that we will fix all of it before release, but what we can do is to provide sufficient information to the stakeholders regarding defects and risks associated with it. The eighth objective is to reduce the level of risks of inadequate software quality, for example, previously undetected failures occurring in operation. This objective is related to the five and sixth objective. We need to find the defect in the same stage in which they are introduced, otherwise, it will be found in the operation. If fault is found during operation, it can have adverse effect. That's why it is necessary to reduce the level of risks of inadequate software quality. The ninth objective is to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards. Sometimes you need to fulfill the legal requirements. For an example, if you are working for automotive industry, then you need to fulfill ISO 26262 standard for safety critical requirement. Till now, we discuss general testing objectives, whereas the objectives are context dependent. To understand this, let's have a look into two different testing levels, component level and acceptance level. When you perform testing at component level, your objective is to find as many defects as possible so that they are not found during operational use. Whereas if you are in acceptance level, your objective is to check if system works as expected. So in different level of testing, the objective changes. Before we end this lecture, let's have a look at the important points. 1. To evaluate work products such as requirements, user stories, design, and code, to verify whether all specified requirements have been fulfilled. 
to validate whether the test object is complete and works as the users and other stakeholders expect to build confidence in the level of quality of the test object, to prevent defects, to find failures and defects, to provide sufficient information to stakeholders to allow them to make informed decisions, especially regarding the level of quality of the test object, to reduce the level of risk of inadequate software quality, for example, previously undetected failures occurring in operation, to comply with contractual, legal, or regulatory requirements or standards, and to verify the test object's compliance with such requirements or standards. Objective of the testing is context-dependent. In this lectures, we are going to understand about testing and debugging. This is the second objective of this syllabus. You need to understand this topic since the topic is marked as K2. First, we will have a look into testing activities. Most important activity of testing is to show failure because we know by now one of the objectives of testing is to find defects. Finding defect is not only activities of testing. Other activity of testing is, once the defect is found, it is very much required to check if found defect is fixed or not. And the last point is testing is done by testers. Now, let's have a look into the debugging activities. Most important activity of debugging is to analyze failure. Once the defect is analyzed and root cause is found, next activity is to fix the defect. And the last point is debugging is done by developers. Now here we will discuss how tester and developer work with respect to defect cycle. First tester finds the defects. Then the found defect is reported to the development team. After getting the defect report, development team starts investigating the failure. While investigating the failure, developer isolates the defect from rest of the software. Once the defect is isolated, developer fixes the defect and then checks defect is fixed or not. Once the defect is fixed, the fixed report is sent to the testing team. After getting the fixed report from developer, tester retests on found defect to confirm if they were really fixed. One more important point to remember is, in agile development and in some other life cycles, testers may be involved in debugging and component testing. Though in general, debugging is developer's task, but in a agile development model, which is very iterative, Sometimes, debugging is done by testers. Before we end this topic, let's have a look into difference between testing and debugging. Very first difference is that testing is performed by tester and debugging is performed by developer. Second difference is testing finds the programming failure, whereas debugging is to demonstrate that program is working fine. Last difference is testing is done with the purpose of finding bug, whereas debugging is done to find the cause of the bug. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. In a guile development and in some other life cycles, testers may be involved in debugging and component testing. Then, we learned about testing and debugging activities. Testing activities are finding defects and confirming defects are fixed, whereas developers' activity is to analyze defects and fix the defects. With this, we end this lecture here. In this lecture, we are going to address why is testing necessary. In order to understand this, we must remember 
that all of us are human. And being human, we make mistakes. And those mistakes can be very expensive. The expense can be loss of money. It can be a crucial loss of time. It can also be a loss of business reputation. And the final and gravest loss is death or injury due to our mistake. In order to avoid these losses and to minimize risk, we have to test every single aspect of our product. Let's take a look at three more points for a better understanding of why is testing necessary. First point is related to risk. We perform testing to reduce the risk associated with the product. And how do we do that? By detecting the defect, which is our next point. We have to detect defects so that they are not seen in operational use. So when the user is using our product, they should not be able to find these defects. It's our responsibility to find them first through testing. The third point is meeting the contract. We have to make sure that we are meeting all the commitments we made to our customers. So if the customer asks for something that is not included in the contract, this is where we find it. So these are the reasons testing is necessary to the process of product development. Let's say there is a developer who works on a code and creates a software. He then directly hands over that software to the customer. Now that the customer has the software, he uses it, but soon becomes very disappointed. Why? Because he has found an error in the software. So now the question arises, why did the customer find the error and not us? The answer is that once the software was developed, we handed it over directly to the customer instead of going through this rigorous process of testing. If we had put the product through this process, it is possible that we could have caught the error before it ever reached the customer. And this is where I have to mention something crucial. We have to perform appropriate testing at appropriate levels. The development of a product can be broken down into several levels of activities. At each level, we have to decide what is the appropriate testing that should be carried out. Let's take a look at these different levels of development activities. The first level is requirements. In a coming video, you will see how testing requirements contributes to success. The second level is the design stage. Here, we will see how testing design contributes to success of the project. After design comes coding. And we will also discuss how testing coding contributes to success. And finally, the software is ready. And we will analyze what kind of software testing will contribute to the success of the product. If we carry out testing at each level, then we will achieve a successful product. The first topic under this section is testing's contribution to success, where we will see how testing at different levels contributes to success. The different levels of software development cycle are requirement level, where software requirements are written. Then comes the design level, where design is made. After that comes the coding level, where code is implemented. And finally, the completed software is ready for testing. Now, with example, we will understand how testing at these levels contributes to success of the overall product. Now let's discuss the first level of testing during development process and that is the requirement level. Here, we will understand how testing during the requirement level will contribute to the success of the whole product or project. In this level, we start by reviewing the requirements. The reviewing is nothing but static testing. 
so we are performing static testing on the requirements. We are doing this to detect the defects in these work products. Here, of course, the work products are just the requirements. So why are we reviewing these requirements? It's to reduce the risk of incorrect or unstable functionality being developed. Which means, if there is something wrong or incorrect in the requirement, and we don't spot it, then that is how the entire project will be developed. This is what we have to stop by performing testing on requirement. To understand this, let's have a look into software development levels. These are the different levels in software development. First, you have the user requirement. Then, you have a system requirement. Now, if we don't correct the error at this level, it goes on and becomes part of the global design and the detailed design, both of which will be wrong. And eventually, we will have a software that doesn't work correctly. So this is why, if we correct the requirement at this stage, the rest of the process will carry out without any errors due to requirement. This is why we say that testing requirements contributes to the success of product. Now let's discuss the second level of testing during development process, and that is at the design level. At design level, there will be a system design. Our job is to do a review on it, since there is no code, so we can't run it. Therefore, we review it, which is a static testing technique. When we do this review, it will increase team members' understanding. So whether it is the tester, developer, or the process guys, everyone will have the same understanding after review. If everyone has the same knowledge, it will help reduce the risk of fundamental design defects. So a review of the system design will reduce the risk of fundamental design defects. Let's go back to our chart. Right now, we are at the global and detailed design stage. If we carry out the testing here and catch the mistake, then it will not go on to the implementation stage we will send the correct software for the dynamic testing, and product will be a success. If we don't do the testing, then we will send a faulty software for dynamic testing, and then we will be forced to go back two steps to find the error. I hope that it's obvious now why testing at the design level is so important. It's because it contributes to the success of the whole project. Now let's discuss the third level of testing during development process, and that is the coding level. So how does testing coding contribute to success? In the coding level, you have code under development. The code is being developed and you will perform a static testing on it. The intention with this is to increase the understanding of that piece of code. What this does is reduce the risk of defects within the code. So if there are any defects, we can find them out by reviewing the code through static testing. Let's bring up our example again. Check window moves up within 10 milliseconds once the button is pressed. For this requirement, the developer has written this code. Try and see if you can tell what the mistake is in this code. The function looks right, but see here. The developer has written if button is pressed for 10 milliseconds or less, then the window will move up. The requirement was for the window to move up within 10 milliseconds, not at 10 milliseconds. The developer has included this sign, which changes the result. Now, the window might not move up unless exactly 10 milliseconds have passed. This is how performing testing at the coding level 
can reveal mistakes in the code and contribute to the success of the whole project. Now let's discuss the final level of testing during development process, and that is the software level. So let's find out how testing the software contributes to the success of the project. Once the software is ready, we verify and validate the software. Now that the software is functional and the codes are ready, we can perform dynamic testing on it. Once we perform dynamic testing, we detect failures that might otherwise have been missed. If we don't do the testing at this level, then there is a fair chance that we will miss some errors and they will finally be discovered when the software is in operational use. Next is removing the defects that cause the failures. So we will fix the problems because of which the software is failing. This is where the debugging process we discussed comes into play. The tester finds the error and tells the developer, who fixes the problem and sends it back to the tester to confirm that the error is gone. And by doing all of this, our software will meet the stakeholders' needs. It will meet the customers' or the users' requirements. And that means everyone using the software will be happy. So this is how testing at the software level helps the product succeed. Users will have an error-free software because you will have found the problems and fixed them before they used it. And that's it with this topic. In this lecture, we will focus on quality assurance and testing. Here, we will address the second topic of this session. At the end of this video, you have to understand the relationship between quality assurance and testing. The first concept is quality assurance, which is also called QA. And the second concept is testing. People often think that quality assurance and testing are the same. This is a mistake. They are not the same, but they are related. How are they related? They are related through a larger concept known as quality management. This concept ties them together. So you have to remember that while quality assurance and testing are not the same, they are related by a larger concept called quality management. Before we have a look into these terms, let's understand this concept first. First, in an organization, we establish quality management. Now, the QM has QA as a subset to ensure that quality requirement will be fulfilled with the help standards and procedures. Inside QA, we have QC to check if quality is fulfilled or not. This checking is done using different testing techniques. Now, let's deal with each of these topics one by one. The first is quality management. This is a series of coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to quality. So we are establishing a management system in an organization. And the objective of this management system is to achieve the quality requirement of the organization. So what is quality management? It is a larger system introduced into an organization with the single goal of achieving the best quality. The next term is quality assurance. This is a part of quality management. Quality management is a bigger system. And out of that, we get quality assurance. And the purpose of QA is to focus on providing confidence that quality requirements will be fulfilled. And the final topic is quality control or testing. 
we already have a management, and we have a standard and procedure. Now we need to implement these concepts. This implementation is done by using quality control. It is the operational techniques and activities, part of quality management, that are focused on fulfilling quality requirements. So, quality management is the larger system, which has two parts, quality assurance and quality control. Quality assurance contains all the documents that tell us what procedures to follow, and quality control is the activities that we have to perform in order to achieve the organization's quality requirements. So this is how you have to remember these three things. Quality control is an activity. Quality assurance is a document or a process. And quality management is the complete system under which quality assurance and quality control work. Now let's look into these two concepts a little more. Quality assurance and quality control. So, quality assurance contains proper processes, while quality control has test activities. So, this has activities and this has processes. Quality control is practical, whereas quality assurance is theoretical. The next point to look at is quality assurance is more about defect prevention. By laying our guidelines and documents, this helps prevent defects. The quality control is a defect detection mechanism. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. First point is quality management ties quality assurance and testing together. Point two is quality assurance is not the same as testing. Third point is definition of quality. Quality is conformance to requirement. That means, in software testing, if we talk about quality, it means we are meeting the requirement. Fourth, an important point, testing is part of quality assurance. And last point is quality control is an end-of-phase activity. Let's understand this point. These are the different phases of software development. If you are in the requirement stage, once the requirement is written, the requirement undergoes testing process as a part of quality control. Similarly, for other stages, once the activity of that stage is done, quality control comes into picture. That's why we say quality control is an end-of-phase activity. In this lecture, we are going to understand the meaning of error, defect, and failure. This topic is marked as K2, so we need to understand this topic to answer the exam questions. Let's start with the definitions and afterwards, I will provide you the detailed explanation. What is error? A human action that produces an incorrect result is called error. Now, let's relate this definition to software testing. If the developer finds mistake in their own code, then it is referred to as an error. Second definition is defect or fault or bug. A flaw in a component or system that can cause the component or system to fail to perform its required function. Now let's relate it to the software testing. Once the software finds the bug and developer accepts it, then it is called as fault. Last definition is a failure. Deviation of the component or system from its expected delivery, service, or result. Suppose you are using the software, but it hangs. That means if the product is in use and it's not working as expected, then it's a failure.
Now let's understand each of these definitions in more detail with example. What is error? A mistake in coding is called an error. If a human makes a mistake in writing a code, then we call it an error. And this is the first stage. The next is defect. Error found by a tester is called defect. After that comes bug. When this defect is accepted by the development team, then it is called a bug. So far, we have three terms. If a programmer finds a mistake in their own code, then it is an error. If the mistake is found by tester, then it is a defect. If that mistake is confirmed to be a problem, then it is called a bug. And when the bug is in this stage, then it is called a fault, because it is the cause of a failure. What is a failure? Once a system is built but it is not meeting the requirements, then it is a failure. So what is causing the failure? The mistake which was not found during fault stage. Now let's use an example to understand this better. Say this is a requirement. If speed is 120 kilometers per hour or more, then overspeed warning shall come. Now say this is a code written by a developer. If speed is greater than 120 kilometers per hour, if he finds the mistake here, then it is an error. What is the mistake here? The requirement is if speed is 120 kilometers per hour or more, but here it is only greater than 120 kilometers per hour. So when speed is equal to 120 kilometers per hour, the overspeed warning will not be shown. If he notices the mistake here, then it will be called an error. If this mistake is found by a tester, then it is a defect. If the developer confirms that yes, you're right, it's a mistake, then it will be called a bug. And normally, developer finds out how many bugs are there, while tester just says that there is a defect. This is how these terminologies are used in an organization, and this stage is called a fault. Now let's say that the mistake is not found in the development stage, and the code becomes a part of the car. So now, if we find this mistake, then it is called a failure. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. Now you shall be in a position to differentiate between fault and failure. Fault is found by the tester and in the development environment, whereas failure is found by the user in the operational use. And it happens due to deviation from the requirement. And the last point is fault is the cause of the failure. In this lecture, we'll discuss different cause of defect. There are two main focuses of this discussion, normal causes of defect and environmental causes of defect. First, we will have a look into normal defect cause. The first is time pressure. If you are working in an environment where you are given very little time to complete your tasks, then it is possible that you will overlook certain things that may cause a defect. Second is human fallibility. As humans, we are all fallible, because fallible means likely to make errors or fail. Nobody's perfect after all. The second cause is inexperienced and insufficiently skilled people. If you work in an organization where there are people without sufficient knowledge of the product, then it may result in a defect. 
The third cause is miscommunication or misunderstanding. If your organization lacks proper channels of communication, this can also lead to defects. The fourth is the complexity of the code, design, and architecture. This means even if you are an experienced, skilled person, if the code is complex, then you might end up making an error. The last cause is new, unfamiliar technologies. If you are working with a technology that you don't know well enough, then this can also result in a defect. So these were the defect causes. Now, let's move on to environmental causes. So the first cause is radiation. Proceeds of radiation can cause a defect. The next one is electromagnetic field. We all know how on flights we are asked to switch off our mobile phones. This is to avoid creating electromagnetic fields which can cause interference. The third one is pollution. So if there are dust particles on the sensor, it could result in an error. And similarly, there could be many other environmental causes. In this lecture, we will talk about defect, root cause, and effect. This topic is marked as K2. At the end of this lecture, you shall be in a position to differentiate what is root cause and what is its effect. Let's begin by defining root cause. It is the earliest actions or conditions that contributed to creating the defects. This means that when you find a defect, you also have to find the first condition that caused the defect. Here, we have an example to help us understand this. Say, we get this requirement. Once the speed is more than 150 km per hour, red light shall glow. The speed needs to be more than 150 km per hour. After getting this feature, customer is unhappy. Because customer checked this device and made the observation that there is a defect. Why? Because when he set the speed to 116, he expected the red light to be on, but he found that it's still off. Now to figure out why this is a defect, we have to do a root cause analysis. We are in the testing stage now, but we have to go back a step to the implementation stage or coding stage. Here, we find that there is a condition that was implemented incorrectly. If speed is equal to or greater than 150. However, our job is not yet done. Remember, we have to find the earliest condition. This means that we have to go one stage back again, which means the requirement or design stage. In this stage, we found that some of the developers have written this system requirement. Red light shall glow when speed is more than 150. So instead of 115, they wrote 150. And because of this, the implementation was done incorrectly and we found the defect in the coding. However, our job is not yet done since we have to find the earliest condition. When we investigated more, it was found that since the communication was verbal, this problem occurred. Now comes the point which you need to understand. Now, your job is to identify effect, failure, fault, or root cause. Customer is unhappy is effect. Observation made by customer is failure. These two statements are defect. And all this problem occurs due to miscommunication, so this is the root cause. So we don't stop at this point. Now, 
we need to find the solution to avoid such problems. So action over here is further communication will be done via email. We will see one more example to illustrate what we learned about defect and root cause analysis. Here is the life cycle of defect root cause analysis. This life cycle starts with a customer complaint, which is also the effect. Why is he complaining? Because he has come across a failure. He has received incorrect interest payment calculation. So the customer is trying to calculate his interests, but received an incorrect result. This was a failure. When we analyze this failure, we find that it was caused by a single line of incorrect code. When we further investigate this defect, we find out that the wrong code was written because of the product owner's misunderstanding of how to calculate interest. This was the root cause of the defect that made the customer complain. So we have this information. The product owner didn't know how to calculate interest. But we can't stop there. We have an entire team, so how is it that the product owner could make this mistake? What we do next is called action. We figure out what to do so this never happens again. We train the product owner in interest calculation. This way, they will not repeat this mistake again. So, you see how everything is connected. This is how root cause analysis works. It starts from an effect that is the complaint and ends with an action that is our method to correct the root cause. Now, we'll look at why we need to do a root cause analysis. The first point is to prevent a significant number of future defects from being introduced. We want to make sure that new defect don't crop up in the future. The second point is to reduce the occurrence of similar defects in the future. So we don't want this interest calculation error to crop up again in our system. The third point is to improve the process. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB certified professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee.
you got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. In this lecture, we will address very important point that is seven testing principles. Let's see the first principle. The first principle says that testing shows the presence of defects, not their absence. Let's break this down. The first point is testing can show that defects are present. So when we carry out testing and find a defect, then we know that there is a problem with the software. So testing can show that defects are present. The second point is that testing cannot prove that there are no defects. Just because you have not found a defect does not mean that there are no defects in the software. So testing can't prove absence of defects. The final point is that testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. So let's try to understand these points with an example. Suppose you have 20 defects in a software, and when you perform testing, you find 5 defects out of it. So you have 20 defects, and you found 5. So the remaining defects are 15, which could not be found. So this is why we say that testing can show that defects are present. We found five, so we know for sure that there are five defects in the software. But we cannot prove that there are no defects in the software. We found five of 20 defects, but there are 15 left that we don't know about. So we cannot prove that there are no defects left in the software. And finally, testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. How does that happen? Initially, we had 20 defects, but we found 5, so only 15 are left. We have reduced the number of defects that the customer can find, so that was the first principle of testing. Let's move to the second principle. Principle 2 says that exhaustive testing is impossible. Please remember this, that exhaustive testing is impossible. The first point to understand about this is testing everything is not feasible. Just because we have a software doesn't mean we can test every single bit of it. The second point is, whenever we do testing, it has to depend on risk analysis. What is the risk of that particular system? Depending upon that we have to see what kind of testing is required. Then, we focus on what type of test techniques are needed and what are the priorities of different features. We can't just test everything. We need to prioritize certain parts based on how important they are. The final point is to focus test effort. When we're testing a feature, we need to know how much effort it requires. This is why exhaustive testing is impossible. Testing requires a certain amount of effort, and that is why testing everything is not feasible. Let's use an example here. Say a customer's requirement is the following. LED shall glow when speed is between 15 and 90 kilometers per hour. So there is a LED that will only glow when the speed is between 15 and 90. One way of testing this requirement is to do a boundary value analysis. For this test, we have taken six values. On one end, we have 14, 15, and 16. And on the other end, we have 89, 90, and 91. So when we do the testing, the LED should not glow at 14 or 15, and on the other, it should not glow for 90 or 91. It should only work for 16 and 89. So only by using six values, we can test if the software meets the customer's requirement. But it is also possible to test with all the values between 15 to 90. 
but that will consume a lot of time and effort. Also, the boundary values serve our purpose. So this is the reason that we say that testing each and every part of the feature is not feasible. It is possible, but not practical. Of course, if the customer asks us, then we can perform testing on all the values in between. Let's look at the third principle of testing now. Principle 3 states that every testing saves time and money. Let's break that down. The first point is that static and dynamic test activities should be started as early as possible. What does that mean? It means that we should start testing as early as possible, whether it is a static test or a dynamic test. Now, let's look at the second point. Early testing is sometimes referred to as shift left. Why is that? Look here. As I'm talking about early testing, I'm shifting to the left of the diagram. The very first stage of testing is at the leftmost corner of the software development life cycle. So early testing is sometimes called shift left. And finally, we come to the last point. It helps to reduce or eliminate costly changes. We can see it in the example to understand that. So here is a very popular graph about the cost and time of finding defects. As you can see, in the requirement stage, the cost of locating a defect is the lowest. When you move to the design stage, it becomes a little costlier. Then, as you move to the build stage and then to the test stage, it gets more and more expensive. Finally, at live use, it is the costliest to discover a defect in the product. So why does this happen? To understand this, we need our life cycle diagram. Suppose we find a defect in the implementation stage, which is the build stage. Just because it was found at this stage does not mean that the error happened here. It might be in the design or the system requirement. It can also be that someone misunderstood the user's requirements, because of which every subsequent stage was wrong and we implemented it incorrectly. So now, to correct this one defect, we have to go back and correct this document, this document, this document, and this one too. All of this will take a lot of time, labor, and resources, which means that it will cost a lot of money. This is why Principle 3 says perform testing as early as possible. If we find an error here, then we can correct it here and every other stage will be fine. Now, we are on the fourth principle of testing. Principle 4 states that defects cluster together. To understand this, let's start with the first point. Sometimes, a small number of modules can contain most of the defects. And point number 2 is those defects can be responsible for most of the operational failures. Though these are only a few modules, the defects present in them can cause operational failure. What is operational failure? It is when the product is in use and fails to perform according to expectations. So if we can identify the module or the part of the software that contains these defects, then it will help us reduce or eliminate costly changes. If we find them during our testings, then they won't crop up during live use and we can save the expenses on correcting them. So that's the fourth principle, to identify the module where most of the defects are clustered together. Now we're on to the fifth principle of testing. Principle 5 states, Beware of the pesticide paradox. What does this mean? Let's find out. Point 1. The same test no longer finds defects. During testing, 
If you've already found a defect in a code, then it is unlikely that you will find a defect again. Unless there is a big change in the code, you will find no more errors since you already found one and corrected it. So then what do we do? Point two. To detect new defects, existing tests and test data may need to change. So you either have to update the test case or the data in it to be able to find new defects in it. And the third point is, when you're performing automated regression testing, the pesticide paradox has a beneficial outcome. When you run automated testings, you are actually running scripts. So if you run the same script, it is highly unlikely that you will find new defects. But if you update your script, add new values to it, or new test cases to it, then there is a possibility of discovering new defects. So this paradox is very beneficial when you're performing an automated testing. Suppose there is a software with 20 defects in it. When you run your script the first time, you find 5 defects. Then, the software is left with 15 defects. Now, if you don't change the test script and you run it for the second and third time, you will find no more defects in the software. No matter how many times you run it, you cannot find the 15 remaining defects. This is because you're running the same script. In order to find new defects, you have to update your script. So this is why our first point said that the same test will no longer find defects. And the second one said, to detect new one, existing tests may need to change. So now you understand the fifth principle. We will cover the sixth principle. It states that testing is context dependent. This means that the type of testing will depend upon the kind of product being tested. This is why testing is context dependent. So let's start breaking this down. Point one, safety critical industry control software is tested differently from an e-commerce mobile app. So a mobile application and a safety critical software will be tested differently. We can't use the same process for both applications. Now, point two. Testing in an Agile project is done differently than testing in a sequential life cycle project. Our methods of testing in an Agile project is completely different from how we test in a sequential life cycle project. The final point is all about e-commerce. This is connected to the first point. How we test e-commerce is completely different. This is why principle 6 emphasizes that testing is context dependent. This principle states that absence of error is a fallacy. If you remember, we have already covered the essence of this in principle 1 and 2. Let's deconstruct that. Point one. In an organization, it is expected that testers can run all possible tests and find all possible defects. This expectation is completely wrong. We can't run all possible tests and we cannot find all possible defects. Point two. Says principle two and one respectively tell us that this is impossible. If you recall, principle 2 says that exhaustive testing is impossible and 1 says that we can never find all the bugs. We can claim to have found a bug, but we cannot claim that there are no defects left in the software. Further, it is a fallacy that is a mistaken belief. So this is an incorrect belief that a tester can find all the mistakes that exist in a software. Our final point here is thoroughly testing all specified requirements and fixing all defects found could still produce a system that is difficult to use. Even if we do everything, there can still be environmental conditions, unfound defects, or other factors 
that can cause the product to fail. It's not in your hands. This is why we cannot say that there are no errors left in a software. If someone claims that, then it is a mistaken belief. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points. In this lecture, we will address test process. Let's first see what is test process and why it's needed. As of now, we know there are seven test objectives, and to fulfill these test objectives, each one of us will have different ways. If we all apply our own ways in an organization, then it is difficult to control and it is less likely to achieve test objectives. That is a reason we need common process, which everyone shall follow as a guideline to achieve the different test objectives. In this syllabus, seven common test activities are mentioned, which can be applied for any product. These seven activities are test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Altogether, these activities are referred to as test process. Under test process, we will have a look into these topics. All these topics are marked as K2, so you need to understand these topics. First topic is, explain the impact of context on the test process. Here, we'll come to know what are the different factors that influence test process. Second topic is, describe the test activities and respective tasks within the test process. Here, I will explain each of the test activities in detail. Third topic is, differentiate the work products that support the test process. We have seven common test activities. After each test activity, we will get the output, which is referred as work product. In this topic, we need to remember which work product belongs to with activities. Last topic is, explain the value of maintaining traceability between the test basis and test work products. Here, we will learn about traceability. In this lecture, we will address keywords related to test process topic. And these are the keywords which we are going to cover in this lecture because they are related to the upcoming topics. Few I will cover now, and remaining will cover while addressing the topic. These are the eight keywords you must know before we go to the test process topic. All the definitions provided here are given by ISTQB itself. Along with the definition, I will provide some real examples for easy understanding of these terms. So let's start with the keywords. First keyword is test basics, and it is defined as the body of knowledge used as the basis for test analysis and design. In simple terms, test basis is nothing but the requirement. Let's see an example to understand this. Suppose this is the requirement. We need a light system which will glow when door is open and close when door is closed. The system shall work like mentioned. 
This is a requirement which we need to test and it is refined as test basics. Now let's see the second keyword, test condition, and it is defined as a testable aspect of a component or system identified as a basis for testing. Let's refer to the same example to find out testable aspect of the requirement. The testable aspects are, first, light shall glow when door is open. Second, light shall not glow when door is closed. After reading the test basics, we got this as a testable condition. Next keyword is test case, and it is defined as a set of preconditions, inputs, actions where applicable, expected results and post conditions developed based on test conditions. In simple words, test cases are set of actions to test the test condition. Let's continue with our example to understand this point. Now, to check these test conditions, we can write two test cases as shown here. Test case one is, first, switch on power, second, open door, three, check light on, four, switch off power. And test case two is, first, switch on power, second, close door, third, check light off, fourth, switch off power. Action to test test condition is called test cases. The next keyword is test procedure, and it is defined as a sequence of test cases in execution order and any associated actions that may be required to set up the initial preconditions and any wrap-up activities post-execution. This term is used mostly when you go for manual testing, where you decide in which order test cases to be executed, or if any precondition or post-conditions are required. Now, let's have a look into test case 1. After the test case is executed, the door shall be closed and light to be switched off. Similarly, for test case 2, during initial condition, the door shall be open and light must be on so that we can see the change. Next keyword is test data, and it is defined as data needed for test execution. This term is used during the automation testing. While executing the test case, we need test data. Let's see the sample data to understand this point. In the test case, we are saying switch on power supply, but we didn't mention how much voltage shall be provided. This data we will get from test data. Similarly, all other values with respect to test cases are stored. These data can be stored in Excel form or any testing specific tools. Let's move to the next keyword, that is test suit, and it is defined as a set of test scripts or test procedures to be executed in a specific test run. Test scripts mean a set of instructions for the execution of a test. By using test case as a reference, test scripts are developed. These test scripts are then arranged in the execution order as shown here. That's why we can say a group of test scripts with a sequence of instructions is called suit. Next keyword is testware. It is defined as work products produced during the test process for use in planning, designing, executing, evaluating, and report on testing. As we know, we have different activities in test process like test planning, test monitoring, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test closure. Each of these activities provide output and these outputs are called testware. Testware are stored for each testing phase for future reference. Last key point is test oracle, and it is defined as a source to determine an expected result to compare with the actual result of the system under test. As the definition says, Test Oracle stores expected result, which is compared against the measured result during test execution. These were the eight keywords which we covered here, and it will be very helpful for you as we cover the following topics. Thank you.
In this lecture, we are going to see how test process varies with respect to its context. First topic of test process is explain the impact of context on the test process. It is marked as K2, which means you need to understand this topic. Before we start the topic, just remember, ISO standard for test process is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-2. First context is based on software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. To understand this point, let's have a look into these two software development lifecycle models, V model and Agile model. V model is an incremental process where all the phases are done sequentially in an incremental way. But in a Guile model, each phases are repeated throughout the development phase. We can see in picture to understand these two processes. In the V model, the complete project is implemented incrementally, and once the development phase is done, corresponding testing activity is started. Whereas in a Guile method, Few features are implemented in a week, and testing is done for that feature. And this repeats throughout the project development. Therefore, same test process is implemented in a different way based on the model used. Just remember, first context is software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. The second context is test level and test type being considered. Based on test level and test type, test process is selected. When we say test level, these are the four different levels mentioned in this course. Component testing, integration testing, system testing, and acceptance testing. And different test types are functional test types, non-functional test types, white box testing, and change-related testing. Each of this will be covered in upcoming lectures. For the time being, just remember, second context is test level and test type. The third context is product and project risk. Let's take an example of two different products, automotive and avionic. By seeing the project, you will come to know which has more risk. Avionics product contain more risk than automotive. Therefore, the test process will be more regressed for product with more risk. For the time being, just remember, third context is product and project risk. The fourth context is business domain, which is similar to last context, product and project risk. To understand this, let's see two different domain, software for supermarket billing and software for banking domain. Clearly, supermarket software will be more focused on load testing, whereas banking software will be tested more with respect to safety aspects. Fourth context is business domain. The fifth context is based on operational constraints. For an example, budget and resource means if assigned budget is less or sufficient to complete the project, time scale means whether you need to complete project in less time or you have sufficient time. Complexity means if the product selected is complex to implement. And last one is contractual and regulatory requirements. Sometime along with the customer requirement, we also need to fulfill industry-related requirement. Like for automotive safety, we need to fulfill ISO 26262 standards. Sixth context is organizational policies and practices. The type of development model used has impact on the test planning and test process. Similarly, the type of test strategy, test techniques, and tools used in an organization influence test process. Last context is required internal and external standards. As mentioned before, ISO 26262 is a safety standard for automotive industry. It's an external standard which organization has to follow if they are working on automotive industry and need to be included in the test process. ASPICE 
is another standard which is related to process. If some organization needs to compliance to ASPICE standard, they have to adopt their process in accordance with ASPICE. Now, let's quickly revise all the points we mentioned with respect to context. Software development lifecycle model and project methodologies being used. Test levels and test types being considered. Product and project risks. Business domain. Operational constraints, including but not limited to budgets and resources, time scales, complexity, contractual and regulatory requirements, organizational policies and practices, required internal and external standards. Before we start with test process, let's have an overview of what we will be seeing in upcoming videos. There are three general aspects of organizational test processes. First aspect is test activity and task. Second aspect is test work product. Third aspect is traceability. Let's understand what they mean. By now, we know Test process is divided into seven different test activities, and they are test planning, test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. Each of these activities has tasks within them, which we will study in detail in future classes. So when we perform these activities, we get certain outputs, and those outputs are referred as test work product. So remember this point. Output of test activity is test work product. Let's see some of the work products which we get out of these test activities. In the test planning stage, we get test plans as output. From test monitoring and control stage, we get test progress report as an output. From test analysis stage, we get list of prioritized test conditions. From test design stage, we get test cases as an output and output of test implementation is test suits. Output of test execution is defect report. And finally, output of test completion is finalized test wares. These are important points from exam point of view. I request you to memorize them at this point of time. Last point is related to traceability. Let's first understand traceability concept, and then we will go through the definition. Suppose customer gave you some requirement to test, and the requirement looks like this. Customer requirement 1. Customer requirement 2. Customer requirement 3. Customer requirement 4. It can go up to 1000 requirements, which we are representing by the letter N here. Once you get these requirements, you will develop test cases for the requirement. And suppose it looks like this. Test case 1. Test case 2. Test case 3, test case 4, and it is up to you how many test cases you want to write to cover all the requirements. But now comes the important question how will you provide the test case for customer requirement 4? It is humanly not possible to provide test case for the requested customer requirement if you have thousands of requirements. To solve this problem, we have traceability. During traceability, we develop a virtual bi-directional link between requirement and test cases by using some tools. Let's see how we do that. As soon as we write the test case for requirement, we link them using a tool. For example, requirement 1 is linked to test case 1. Since we have a bi-directional traceability, anytime we can see which test case is connected to requirement 1 or which requirement is connected to test case 1. Similar way, we can provide traceability for other test cases. Now you can see each requirement has test cases. This is all about the traceability concept. Now let's see the definition. To maintain traceability throughout the test process between each element of the test basis and the various test work products associated with that element. 
Traceability is nothing but linking between requirement, test condition, test case, and report. So just remember three aspects of organizational test process are test activity and task, test work product, and traceability. Last point is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-2 has information about test process and ISO IEC IEEE 29119-3 has information about test work products. With this, we end this lecture here. Let's start with the first activity of test process, that is, test planning. We know by now these are the seven test processes. It starts from test planning, then comes test monitoring and control, test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and ends with test completion. So let's understand what is test planning and what are the different tasks done under it. Test planning involves activities that define the objectives of testing. So test planning is the stage where we decide what we need to test and what we want to achieve from it. It also includes approach for meeting test objectives within constraints imposed by the context. We know that testing is context dependent. Based on what we test, we decide in test planning stage which approach we will use. And last point is test plans may be revisited based on feedback from monitoring and control activities. The question is why we need to revisit test plan. Suppose while testing you find that you cannot achieve the defined objective. It could be due to time constraints. In that case, we need to revisit test plan to see if we can increase the testing time or we increase resource to complete testing in same time or we go for risk-based testing by keeping time and resource constant. So any time during testing, we will the defined objective or approach is not feasible that we will need to revisit test plan and update it. So these are the three main points of test planning. Defining test objective, defining test approach, updating plan base on feedback. Now below are the points which are mentioned in fifth chapter, but we are including them here for the better understanding of the topic. In test planning stage, we determine the scope objectives and risks of testing. Since test planning is the first activity of test process, we define the roadmap of testing here. We decide what will be the scope of our testing, whether we want to perform integration testing or software testing or system testing or all of this. Next is objective. We can determine that we want to do 50% of the testing or we only to perform testing on priority one features. Like this, there can be another objective which we would like to achieve. Next is risk. Once we get the project, we analyze the risk associated with the feature and based on that, we decide whether to go for testing based on the features implemented or based on analyzed risk. First point is determining the scope, objectives, and risks of testing. Second task in test planning is defining the overall approach of testing. We know that testing is context dependent. Based on what we test, we decide which approach we will use. For an example, we can go for risk-based testing if this release is critical to the customer. We can go for priority-based testing to make sure that we perform the testing on critical features as early as possible so that if any bug is found, it can be fixed and released. Or go for requirement-based testing to make sure if all the requirements are tested before release. Or choose related testing to make sure all the changed features are testing before release. Third point is integrating and coordinating the test activities into the software lifecycle activities. Let's see this example. Here we saw how traceability depends on the tool and to provide the traceability between all the work products, we need to integrate test activities into software lifecycle activities. Let's move to fourth point. In test planning, we answer what to test and how to test. Let's see how. In test planning state, 
We make decision about what to test, the people and other resources required to perform the various test activities, and how test activities will be carried out. Fifth point is related to task scheduling. Let's see an example of scheduling. This is the roadmap prepared during test planning. Here, we define when testing will start, when test analysis and design shall be completed. Similarly, other test activities are planned. Sixth point is related to metrics. In test planning stage, we select metrics for test monitoring and control. For an example, let's have a look into traceability. Suppose, in planning, we decide a matrix to activate 100% traceability. But if the testing team do not write test case for one of the customer requirements, then we will not get the link. Since all the data is in tool, by putting some filters, we can easily find out how many requirements are linked and how many are not. This way, we get different data through matrix. Seventh point is related to budget. In the planning stage, we finalize budgeting for the test activities. Eighth point is about documentation. In planning stage, we determine the level of detail and structure for test documentation. Here, we decide which document we need at the end of the testing activating, and during testing, we collect data for the documents. Last point is a very important point. Test planning is a continuous activity and is performed throughout the product's life cycle, which means test planning is not a one-time activity. It is done throughout the development cycle. Please go through all the points once again to remember each point. See you in next lecture. In this lecture, we will discuss test monitoring and control. Test monitoring and control is the second test activity of test planning. As we know, test planning draws the roadmap for the test activity, which includes scheduling, like when testing will start, when it will end, similarly for all other test activities. But in reality, it is not possible to provide the fixed timing and follow it due to many operational issues. That is the reason it is advised to monitor current status of each test activity against the planned one so that if there is any lag, we can take necessary action to meet the planned schedule. Now let's see the definition of test monitoring, test control, and then we see an important point on test monitoring and test planning. Test monitoring involves the ongoing comparison of actual progress against planned progress using any test monitoring metrics defined in the test plan. Let's have a look into this. In test planning stage, we decide when the analysis will start and when it will end. While monitoring, we compare the current status of test analysis with the planned schedule. Next term is test control. It involves taking actions necessary to meet the objectives of the test plan. And the last point is test monitoring and control. They're supported by the evaluation of exit criteria, which are referred to as the definition of done in some software development lifecycle models. We will understand what is evaluation of exit criteria in next slide. Evaluation of exit criteria include checking, assessing, and determining. We have to check test results and logs against specified coverage criteria. We have to assess the level of component or system quality based on test results and logs. And we need to determine if more tests are needed. These are the points based on which we need to evaluate the exit criteria. One of the important points why we do test monitoring and control is to communicate information to the stakeholder. Let's see what type of information we share. First point is, test progress against the plan. Second point is if there is any deviations from the plan. And the last point is information to support any decision to stop testing. So these are the different information we communicate to stakeholder 
and this information is gathered during test monitoring phases. In this lecture, we will address remaining test activities. As of now, test planning, test monitoring, and control is covered. Now, we will focus on test analysis, test design, test implementation, test execution, and test completion. First start with test analysis. During test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. Now, I will break down this definition and explain to you with the help of an example. First point which you need to remember is during test analysis, we look for what to test. During test analysis, test basis is analyzed. As we know, test basis is nothing but the requirement. Suppose this is the requirement. We need a light system which will glow when door is open and close when door is closed. The system shall work like mentioned. This is only a requirement. Now from the requirement, we need to find testable feature. From this requirement, we get this as a testable feature. Light shall glow when door is open and close when door is closed. We will not stop here. We have to find the test condition. From test feature, we finally derive these test conditions. First, light shall glow when door is open. Second, light shall not glow when door is closed. So that's why we say, during test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. Next test activity is test design. And during test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. Now let's see an example to understand this definition. During test analysis, we used to ask what to test, whereas during test design, we ask how to test. Here, we elaborate the test condition to high-level test cases. Let's understand this. We already saw how we get test condition from test basis. Now, during test design, we write test cases based on test condition. This is the example how we write test case. Test case 1. Switch on power. Open door. Check light on. Switch off power. Test case 2. Switch on power. Close door. Check light off. Switch off power. This two test case will cover two test condition. Now along with writing test case, we also identify the defect in the test basis. Because while writing test case, we refer test condition and test basis. And during this, if we find any mistake, we shall report it. That is why we say, during test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. After test design comes test implementation, and during test implementation, the testware necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. Now let's understand this with the help of an example. 
As of now, we know during test analysis, we ask what to test. During test design, we ask how to test. And now, during test implementation, we ask, do we now have everything in place to run the tests? First point is, testware necessary for test execution is created and completed. To test our requirement, we need computer, switch, battery, door, and light. So during test implementation, we need to arrange them and check if they are in ready state. Second point is sequencing the test cases into test procedures. During test implementation, we sequence the test cases based on priority or risk. As you can see here how test cases are sequenced, and this is the order we will execute them. And last point is related to test script. This point is applicable only if you are doing automation testing. Here, test cases are converted into test scripts so that they can be automatically executed. That's why we say, during test implementation, the test where necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. After test implementation comes test execution. And during test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Here, we ask a question, are all tests run? Here, we run all the test suits. Test suits consist of set of test cases. We already saw this test suit, and during test execution, we run them at this order. Second point is after running the test cases, we complete and evaluate the result. Here, the expected result is compared with the measured result. That's why we say, during test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Last activity of test process is test completion. Test completion activities collect data from completed test activities to consolidate experience, testware, and any other relevant information. So this is the activity where we collect all the output from the previous activity. Now let's understand this. Till now, we saw. In test planning, output is test plan. In test monitoring, output is feedbacks. In test analysis, output is test conditions. Output of test design is test case. Output of test implementation is test script and the output of test execution is test result. Now, let's revise all the definition again before we end this lecture. First point is test analysis. During test analysis, the test basis is analyzed to identify testable features and define associated test conditions. And we ask what to test. Second activity is test design. During test design, the test conditions are elaborated into high-level test cases, sets of high-level test cases, and other testware. And we ask the question, how to test? Third activity is test implementation. During test implementation, the testware necessary for test execution is created and completed, including sequencing the test cases into test procedures. And here, we ask, is everything ready for test? Fourth activity is test execution. During test execution, test suits are run in accordance with the test execution schedule. Here, we can ask, are all the results compared? Fifth activity is test completion. Test completion activities collect data from completed test activities to consolidate experience, testware, and any other relevant information. Here, we can ask, have we collected all the data? In the previous lecture, we saw different activities of test process, and in this lecture, 
we will see what is the output of those activities. The output of the test activity is called test work product. So this is going to be our third topic of this session, where we have to differentiate the work products that support the test process. And it is marked as K2, so we have to understand this topic. Similar to test process, we have ISO standard for test work product. And it is ISO IEC IEEE 29119-3. This standard only provides the template, but actual implementation depends on the context, as we saw in the test process. It varies from organization to organization and product to product. Now let's see what is the output of test planning and test monitoring phase. The output of test planning is test plans, which contains all the scheduling related details, exit criteria, it tells when to say test activity is completed, traceability information, here we decide link between test basis and output of test activity. Now let's see the output of test monitoring stage. As we know, test monitoring is done at each test activity, and at the end of that test activity, we collect the test report of that stage like test progress report, test summary report. And during test monitoring, we decide if task is completed, resources allocated properly, and they are used efficiently, or if additional effort is required. These were the test work products of test planning and test monitoring. Now let's see the output of test analysis, design, implementation, execution, and completion. We will start with test analysis. First output which we get is defined and prioritized test conditions. So along with finding the test condition, we also prioritize them. Second output is creation of test charter. Test charter means documentation of the goal or objective for a test session. Third output is discovery and reporting of defects in the test basis. Now let's see the output of test design activity. First output is test case and set of test case. As we know, during test design, we write test cases and therefore test case is the output. Second point is identification of the test data. Here, be careful. In the test design stage, we only identify the test data. We don't prepare them. Preparation of the test data is done in test implementation stage, so be careful with this point. Similar to this is the third point. Test environment is designed in the test design stage, whereas it is implemented in the test implementation stage. Along with test data and test environment, test infrastructure and tools are identified in this stage. So be careful with these points. Test data, test environment, infrastructure, and tool are only identified in test design stage. Now let's see the work product of test implementation. First output is test procedures and the sequencing of those test procedures. Second output is test suits. Test suit is collection of test scripts in execution order. Third point is test execution schedule. Fourth output is service virtualization and automated test scripts. In some cases, test implementation involves creating work products using or used by tools, such as service virtualization and automated test scripts. Fifth output is creation of test data and test environment. During test design, we only identify test data and test environment, but in test implementation, they are created. Last point is, test conditions defined in test analysis may be further refined in test implementation. Now let's see the work product of test execution. First output is, Documentation of the status of individual test cases or test procedures. Since the test case is run here, we need to document how many test cases are ready to run, 
How many test cases are passed and failed? How many test cases didn't execute? And how many test cases we didn't execute deliberately? Second output is defect report. During test execution, test cases are executed and expected result is compared with measured result. And if they are not same, then defect is reported. Third output is documentation about which test item, test object, test tools, and testware were involved in the testing. So all the things used during test execution are documented and stored so that they can be used again if asked. Finally, test completion. This is the test activity which comes once all other test activities are completed. So here, our task is to collect all the reports like test summary report. Along with report, we need to document any improvement points which we can use for next release. Next point is related to change request or backlog. During test activity, if we didn't test any test case or if we didn't execute some test scripts, then we need to document them so that we can address them in next release. Last point is finalized testware. Everything which was used during testing and all the output are stored. Many of the test work products described in this section can be captured and managed using test management tools and defect management tools. This was the complete explanation of test work product topic. This topic is very important, so please read it once again, and if necessary, watch the video again to remember all the points mentioned. Thank you. In this lecture, we are going to discuss about traceability. This is going to be the last topic of this session. Here, we will explain the value of maintaining traceability between the test basis and test work product, and it is marked as K2. Let's first understand the concept of traceability. It starts with test basis. From test basis, we derive test condition. Then, we develop test cases for each test condition. After that, we develop test script based on test cases. And finally, we get result. Now let's see how traceability is established between test basis and test work product. First, the traceability is maintained between test basis and test condition. Now, we have two test cases for these test conditions, so each of these test conditions need to be traced to test cases. Test condition 1 is traced with test case 1. Now test case 1 shall be traced with test script 1. And finally, test script is traced with result. Now, if customer wants to know how we tested test condition 1, we can show them using this traceability. Similarly, for test condition 2, we have to establish traceability. By now, we know what is traceability. Now, let's understand why traceability is required. First point is to implement effective test monitoring and control process. Second point is to revent to test planning based on the feedback. Third point is to communicate to stakeholder. Now let's see the importance of traceability. First point is analyzing the impact of change. To understand this, suppose there is a change in the requirement. Then due to traceability, we will come to know which all work products are affected and for the base, we will update them. Second point is making testing auditable. Now, since every item is linked, it is easy while auditing the project. Point number three is meeting IT governance criteria. Fourth point is improving the understandability of test progress reports and test summary reports to include the status of elements of the test basis. For example, requirements that pass their tests 
requirements that failed their tests, and requirements that have pending tests. This point is self-explanatory. Fifth point is relating the technical aspects of testing to stakeholders in terms that they can understand. Since we provide the traceability, now we can generate different types of matrix and provide it to stakeholders. Last point is providing information to assess product quality, process capability, and project progress against business goals. Since we have different matrices, we can assess product quality and its process. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB Certified Professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. Today, we're covering psychology of testing. The first thing we need to learn is the concept of confirmation bias. Here's the definition. It is difficult to accept information that disagrees with currently held beliefs. So when a human is faced with an idea that goes against what he believes, he will refuse to accept it. Our human here is a software developer and when someone comes and tells him that his software is not functioning properly, it's difficult for him to believe that. This is nothing new. It is a common human trait to blame the bearer of bad news. In our example, the bearer of bad news is the tester, because he is going to the developer to tell him that his software is not working correctly. So how do you handle this kind of situation between the tester and the developer. The action point is, information about defects and failures should be communicated in a constructive way. So, whenever the tester finds a defect and has to tell the developer, he has to find a constructive way to communicate. He shouldn't criticize the developer, but stick to explaining what the real problem is. So now, we move on to human psychology and testing. It is the tester's job to understand how the other person feels when he tells them that their software isn't working well. In order to do that, he needs to communicate well. He should develop his communication skills so that he isn't criticizing the developer, but giving constructive feedback. 
To further help with this aspect, the tester should keep the following points in mind. Start with collaboration rather than battle. You do this by emphasizing the benefits of testing. You make the developer understand how testing is helping his software. Confirm that the other person has understood what has been said and vice versa. You have to be sure that the developer understood everything you said and that you understood everything that the developer has said. And finally, communicate test results and other findings in a neutral, fact-focused way. So you should have all the documents, all the test scripts, and results with you that would support your point. This will show the developer why his product isn't working, and you will have avoided any conflict resulting from hurt feelings. That's all from this video. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, happy testing! Hello! Now we're going to discuss the mindset of testers and developers. First, we'll talk about the developer's mindset. The developer has to design and build a product. Next is, they have to design and build solutions. If there is a defect or a new feature needs to be added, they have to come up with the solution for them. And finally, the most important point, Confirmation bias makes it difficult to find mistakes in their own work. Since developers are creating their own codes, it's hard for them to spot their own mistakes. So now, let's take a look at tester's mindset. The first point is that tester will verify and validate the product. Developer designs the products, and the tester verifies and validates it. The second is that the tester needs to have curiosity a critical eye and attention to detail. So whenever they are reading the requirement, they should pay close attention and try to understand the requirement from different perspectives. Finally, the tester needs to have the motivation to establish good and positive communications and relationships with other team members. Having said all that, we now come to a very important point. Independent testers increase defect detection effectiveness. A tester is most effective when they think independent and are not biased against the developer. They will find the defects because they have a fresh perspective on the product. And this will lead to productive discussions between the tester and the developer. So once again, independent testers increase defect detection effectiveness. That's all from this video. I'll see you next time. Before we start this chapter, we shall have a look into few keywords so that you pay more attention to them when they come across. These are the keywords. Please read them by your own. And please pay more attention whenever they appear during lecture. In this lecture, we are going to see software development lifecycle models. There are two learning objectives in this session, and in this lecture, we are going to address first learning objective. Explain the relationships between software development activities and test activities in the software development lifecycle. The first topic we'll study is development and testing activity. So here, will establish a relationship between the development activities and the testing activities. Let's begin by studying the characteristics of good software development lifecycle model. When you have a new project, you will select a software development lifecycle model for it, according to the requirements of the project. 
So once you select the software development lifecycle model, you can add a few characteristics that would make it more suitable for your project. That is what we'll see here. Suppose you have a development model. For this model, you should have a test activity. That is why we say here, each development activity should have a test activity. Once you have a test activity, then each test activity must have objective, analysis, and design. So whenever you're performing tests, you need to have an objective. And in order to achieve that objective, you need an analysis and design stage. Now, testing is not done in isolation. The tester is deeply involved, so he should get an opportunity to participate in discussion and reviews. He should be part of meetings and allowed to put forward his ideas to the team. And that is basically everything I wanted to cover in this topic. Let's go over it one more time quickly. Once you select a development lifecycle model, each development activity should have test activities. Each test activity should have objective, analysis, and design, and testers should be part of discussion and review. Now we're going to discuss the first software lifecycle model, that is, the sequential development model. Example of sequential model is the waterfall model. We'll get into why it is named that way later. Here's the definition of the model. A sequential development model describes the software development process as a linear sequential flow of activities. In this model, the development model is defined as a linear or sequential flow of activities. So let's take a better look at the model. The first activity in this model is the requirement activity. Here, we analyze the requirement. Then, we'll go into the design phase, where we will write the test condition and test case. After that, we'll start building the software, which is the implementation stage of the process. When we've done through all these activities and our software is ready, then we go into testing. Here, we will test the software for defects, and if any are found, we will fix them. Once the software passes through testing, it will be released to the customer. So these are the activities in the sequential model. And as you see, they are in linear flow. You have requirement, design, build, testing, and release. But this type of model has a drawback. Until we finish the first three steps, we don't test the software we're building. We only test it once we reach this level. This is a big disadvantage of this model and it is the reason we usually choose to work with other models. We'll study them next. Now, before concluding this topic, there are a few points we need to remember about the waterfall model. The first point is, any phase in the development process should begin when the previous phase is complete. We can only start the second phase once the first phase is complete. Once requirement is completed, we can start with design and so on. Now the second point. In theory, there is no overlap of phases. As we've seen in the diagram, there is no overlap in phases. Once requirement is done, we start the design phase. Once design is done, we start the build phase. Then test, then release. But in practice, it is beneficial to have early feedback from the following phases. So while the model doesn't allow for any overlaps in practice, it is better for the product for there to be some overlap between the phases. The final point is test activities only occur after all other development activities have been completed. This is the big drawback of this model. Testing only starts after the development activities are over. We don't have any early feedback process in this model. And that is the reason we usually choose the V model or the Agile development model instead of this one. Now let's understand second life cycle development model. This one is called incremental development model. 
The example for incremental development is V model. So let's find out what that is. So first, we have a user requirement, which is provided by the customer. Then, from the user requirement, we write the system requirement. Once the system requirement is in place, we will write the global design and the detailed design. And once the design is done, we will start implementing the software. These are the steps in this development activity. You can get the user requirement, create the system requirement, then develop the global and detailed design. And finally, you implement the code. Now, once the implementation is over, the software is ready. Then we perform a component testing on it. Once that is done, we perform an integration testing. After integration, we will do system testing. And finally, the acceptance testing. And after the software phase is through all these tests, it will be ready for the operational system use. As you can see, this development model looks exactly like a V, which is where its name comes from. Now, how is this model more advantageous than the sequential model? The advantage is that all these testing activities are parallel to the development activities. Let's take a look. These are the development activities, and these are the testing activities. Once you have the user requirement, even if you have not done any of the below steps, you can start preparing test activities from the requirement for the acceptance testing. Similarly, when you're in the system requirement stage, you can start preparing for the system test. Since you have the requirements, you can start writing the test causes. Once the software comes, you can execute them. The process is happening parallelly. When the development activity starts, the testing activities can also start at the same time. Now let's move on to the design phase. Once you have the design, you know how the components are going to interact. What are the interfaces between them? So once you know all that, you can start to prepare test cases for the integration testing. And finally, when you have the implemented code, you can start component testing. So this is how this development model functions. All the development activities on the left corresponds with the testing activities on the right. Here, you will start getting feedback as early as possible. Once you have the user requirement, testing will begin. This gives the incremental a tremendous advantage over the sequential model. Now, there are a few points to remember. The first, incremental development involves establishing requirements, designing, building, and testing system in pieces, which means that the software's features grow incrementally. So with the incremental model, you analyze and test the system in bits and pieces. Whereas with the sequential model, you analyze and test several stages at once. As an example, with the incremental model, if the customer says, this month we need five features implemented, then you will read the requirements for only those five features. You will analyze and test those five features and implement them. Then, next month, you will take up another five new features to analyze and test. In one month, it gets five features. In two months, it gets 10 features. This is how the software grows incrementally by a few pieces every month. The second point is the size of these features increments vary, with some methods having larger pieces and some smaller pieces. So the size of code you develop for your software at each increment depends upon the need of your project. The third point is, the feature increment can be as small as a single change to a user interface screen or new query option. You won't be developing five features with every increment. You may just be asked to do one new line of code or fix one small feature. But even for that, you will perform a complete testing activity. So this is how your software will be built in increments.
we will talk about the third software development lifecycle model, the iterative development model. So the example of iterative is a Guile model. This is the most popular model in the industry right now. Once you finish this course, you can go for the Agile model. Now, suppose you have a software that you need to implement in three weeks, and it has 15 requirements. If you use the Agile model, then this is how it will work. The Agile model will have three different phases. Each phase will be for one week. Phase one is for the first week. Phase two is for the second week. And phase three will show the third week. Since we have to complete the project in three weeks, the time has been divided in this way. Now we have 15 requirements. So we decide to develop five requirements in phase one, five in phase two, and five in phase three. At the end of three weeks, we will have 15 implemented requirements. Why are we doing this in phases? Because we analyze and test and develop the first five requirements, then send it to the customer for feedback. If there are any changes to be made in the process, we will find out about it in the first phase. Then, as per the feedback, we can implement that in phase two. This is the biggest advantage with the Agile method. You get the customer's feedback from the earliest stage. And in every stage, when you release the software to the customer, it will be fully working. So at the end of phase one, you have five requirements in working stage. But at the end of phase two, you won't be releasing just five requirements to the customer for feedback. You will be releasing 10 requirements in working stage from phase one and two. And at the end of phase three, of course, you should have a complete working software with all 15 requirements fulfilled. This is how the Agile method works. Each phase has define, develop, build, test, and implementation stage. So we can see that live implementation of the software will happen in all the phases. We are repeating the steps in each one. And this is why it is called an iterative development model. Now let's go over a few key points that you should remember. Point one, iterative development occurs when groups of features are specified, designed, built, and tested together. So if you will have some requirements that will be designed, built, and tested together in a series of cycles, as you saw, we tested the requirements repeatedly in one phase after another, often of a fixed duration, like we had a fixed duration of one week for each phase. Now, point two. Iterations may involve changes to features development in earlier iterations, along with changes in project scope. So once you've developed a feature in phase one, the customer gives feedback on it. If he doesn't like something, then you go to the phase two, make the changes he wants in the phase one feature, as well as the next feature you're developing. So that way, you will have a change request as well as a new feature. Point three. Each iteration delivers working software, which is a growing subset of the overall set of features until the final software is delivered or development is stopped. So what they're saying is, when we have 15 total requirements, the five requirements we developed in phase one were the subset of the overall set of features. This process only ends when we deliver all 15 requirements in working stage. As we saw previously, the test process is context dependent. Similarly, software development lifecycle model is context dependent. And we are going to address second objective of the session, identify reasons why software development lifecycle models must be adapted to the context of project and product characteristics. Now let's understand software development lifecycle model, selection procedures. 
So what are the factors that affect the selection of software development lifecycle models? Now let's look at this statement. Software development lifecycle models must be selected and adapted to the context of project and product characteristics. So the context of the project and the product characteristics decides which software development model you select. Next is product characteristic. What type of product do you want to build? That is what will decide which development model you choose. Next is project goal and type. The goal of your project will also influence the decision. After that is business properties. This talks about the kind of resources you have available, the type of organization you're working in. Then you have time to market. The product's release schedule can also decide what type of model you choose. Say, if you want to release it early, then you can go for the Agile model, since it's a very fast process. Project Context Just like the product characteristics or goal, the context will also affect your choice of a development model. And finally, you have project and product risk. This is a very important factor. What is the risk associated with your product? Is it safety related or security related? This consideration will also have to be kept in mind when selecting a model. So these are all the factors that can influence model selection. But you might be asking what context means here. The context is which type of system you want to develop. Developing on whether you want to develop a security lifecycle model or a safety critical system, you would choose different development models. Now we'll get into some good examples, which will help you clear up how software development lifecycle models are selected or combined. First, we will see how test level is combined with test activities to achieve project context. The first example is one where we combine test level and test activities. This is to achieve product context. Now here's the example. Suppose we have to do integration testing for a test level, and our testing activity is interoperability testing. We want to combine the two to achieve our project context. So let's look at this project context that requires the combination of these test level and activities. Integration of commercial of the self software product into a large system. This means there are smaller components of a software that will be combined to create the larger system. Or if you have a large system, another company can provide a small software for support, which can be integrated into your system. And sometimes the purchase team may perform interoperability testing at the system integration level. So when the team is carrying out the integration testing, they will do the interoperability testing too. Let's now move to the second example. Here again, we combine test level and test activities to achieve project context. Suppose you have a functional or non-functional testing level and operational testing activity. We combine the two for a project context. Here's what that context looks like. We want to do an acceptance level testing. Sometimes functional or non-functional acceptance and operational testing are combined together during acceptance testing. So to achieve acceptance level testing, we combine the test level and test activities here. Now we'll get into some good examples, which will help you clear up how software development lifecycle models are selected or combined to achieve project goal. Now we take a look at how different models are combined. Here we have two models of software development lifecycle, model one and model two. We are not combining test levels and activities here, but two software development models in order to achieve the project goal. Now, suppose the product is in the prototype state. Prototype means that it is the initial or starting stage. For this, 
you can use the incremental model. Over time, you can develop small features little by little. But if the product is in the development stage, then you want to use the Guile method. This will let you get the product ready to launch into the market as early as possible. But if the product is in the maintenance stage, like when the customer comes back with a defect and you have to correct it, then you use the V model. So as you can see, we use different software development lifecycle models to achieve the final project goal. We use incremental model for the prototype stage, the Guile method for the development stage, and V model for the maintenance stage. So you had a single product and different decisions at different levels. Now, on to the second example. Here, you have a single product, but different objects. However, you're still combining different models to achieve project goal. Suppose a company creates a device, develops a product, and provides a service. For each of these objects, they can use separate software development cycle models. In order to provide service, they can choose to use one model. To develop a product, they can use another. And to manufacture a device, they can utilize yet another model. So in this video, we saw a few examples of how different models can be combined or test levels and activities can be combined to achieve a project goal or context. In this lecture, we are going to cover one of the important topic that is test level. There is only one learning objective in this session, but it contains a lot of topic in it. Here, we have to compare the different test levels from the perspective of objectives, test bases, test objects, typical defects and failures, and approaches and responsibilities. Let's start with a definition. What are test levels? Test levels are groups of test activities that are organized and managed together. Now let's try to figure out where test levels come in in the larger picture. Here is the test process. This test process will have different test levels. And the test levels will have different test activities inside them, which are organized and managed together in order to achieve the objective. Now, there is a point you need to remember. For every test level, a suitable test environment is required. Component testing and system testing require two different test environments. With that being said, let's look at the different test levels. The first is component testing. As soon as your code is ready, we'll perform the component testing. Once that is done, the next level of testing is integration testing. Here, you'll be able to see how two components or more interact with each other. Next, you will carry out the system testing, after which you will do the acceptance testing. Now, where is each type of testing conducted? The first two, component and integration testing, is carried out in the developer's lab setup. So wherever the developer is, they can perform these tests. But for the next two, system testing and acceptance testing, you require a test environment. This can be a real or simulated environment suited to the needs of the test. In the coming lectures, for each of the test levels, we're going to see specific objective of that level, and then we will see what are the different test bases required for that level. Here, test bases means different types of requirements. Next, we need to understand which test object shall be tested under the test level. Test object is nothing but test item, which is under test. After test object, we have to remember type of defect and failure found under test level. And at last, we need to know who is responsible for testing in particular test level. So soon, we are going to get lots of information and you have to remember all the points.
In this lecture, we are going to compare definition of different test levels. Let's first see the definition of component testing. Here, testing is performed on each individual component separately without integrating with other components. So when we conduct component testing, we focus on the individual and it's not connected with any other parts of the software. Now let's use an example to understand this definition. Let's say this is the requirement given by the customer. If the speed of the motor is more than 150 kilometers per hour and temperature value is greater than 120 degrees, then switch off the motor. So they want to switch the motor off if the speed is higher than 150 kilometers per hour and the temperature is greater than 120 degrees. For this requirement, the developer writes the following code, which he divides into three functions. In the first function, he checks the speed of the motor. In the second one, he checks the value of the temperature. And in the third one, he controls the motor. Should it stop or keep running? Now, if we were to perform component testing on this code, we would have to separate each component. This would be component A, where we only test the motor speed. The second function is component B, where we only test the temperature value. And the third function is component C, where we test the motor movement. So, as you see, there are three components in this code that need to be independently tested. Under component testing, there is no relationship between component A and B, or A and C. They are all just individual units here. When we perform testing on each of these, it's called component testing. Now, now let's see the definition of integration testing. So the definition of integration testing is as follows. When individual software modules are integrated logically and tested as a group. What this means is, we have individual components. So first we group them, then we perform testing on them. To understand this concept better, let's use an example. Suppose our customer has given us the requirement. If the speed of the motor is more than 150 kilometers per hour, and temperature value is greater than 120 degrees, then switch off the motor. Now let's say the developer has written this code for the requirement, and we want to perform integration testing on it. We already know that to perform component testing, we have to take each of these functions and test them separately. For integration testing, we have to take two components, like A and B, and test them together. What we are checking here is, if the value of speed in A is rising, is the value of temperature in B also rising? This shows us the iteration between the two modules. We can also perform this test on components C and B. Just remember that you have to take, at minimum, two units to perform this test. At maximum, you can test all three components together. Now let's take a look at the levels of integration testing. The first level is component integration testing. The second level is system integration testing. So the first point here is component integration testing focuses on interactions and interfaces between integrated components. So in component integration testing, we check interactions between two components. But when you are in system integration testing, you check interactions and interfaces between systems, packages, and microservices. If there are multiple systems, then we check the interaction between those systems. Next is, when is component integration testing performed? It is performed after component testing. Similarly, system integration testing is performed after system testing. The final point is iterative. Component integration testing is part of continuous integration process. When you develop a code, 
you do a component testing, then an integration testing, and so on. It is an iterative process. It is done by external organizations. Some companies give part of their software to different, smaller companies to test and develop. When the components come back to the main company, they test to see if they are all working well together. So this is what you need to know about component and system integration testing. You should mainly remember that component integration testing is done after the component testing, while system integration testing is done after the system testing. Let's start with system testing definition. So the system testing definition is, system testing is the testing of a complete and fully integrated software product. The key phrase here is complete and fully integrated. This means that the integration testing has been done and all components are fully integrated. Let's use an example to illustrate this concept. Suppose we have this requirement from our customer. If the speed of the motor is more than 150 km per hour and the temperature value is greater than 120 degrees, then switch off the motor. We're already familiar with this requirement from previous examples, but now let's see how a system testing is carried out on it. We know that there are three components to the code written for requirements implementation, but when we are performing system testing, we don't care about the components. We only care about the complete system. What we need is to find the values that are of importance to the system. Here, there are two important values, the value of the speed and the value of the temperature. If we raise both these values, then the motor will stop. So we give two values to the system, 151 speed, which is greater than 150 kilometers per hour, and 121 temperature, which is greater than 120 degrees. If the system is working, then as soon as the motor reaches these values, it should stop. So this is how a system testing is carried out. We don't care about how the code is written. What we care about, if we give a set of inputs, then what will be the output? We deal with input and output under system testing. Now we'll discuss the definition of acceptance testing. Now acceptance testing is performed when the complete system has been implemented. Once the system is ready, we test to see if we can accept its performance. This is the official definition. Formal testing with respect to use needs, requirements, and business process is conducted to determine whether or not a system satisfies the acceptance criteria. There are certain acceptance criteria in place. Once a system is ready, we carry out acceptance testing to check if it is fulfilling those criteria. If yes, then the customer will accept the product. And to enable the user, customer, or other authorized entity to determine whether or not to accept the system, the whole point of acceptance testing is to meet the user's need and check if the system is acceptable or not. Now, there are different types of acceptance testing. In this course, we will learn about four types. The first is user acceptance testing, or UAT. The second is Operational Acceptance Testing, or OAT. The third is Contractual or Regulatory Acceptance Testing. And fourth is Alpha and Beta Testing. These are the types of acceptance testing that we will be studying about. Let's go through the definition quickly. First is Component Testing. Here, testing is performed on each individual component separately without integrating with other components. Second is integration testing. Here, individual software models are integrated logically and tested as a group. Next is system testing. System testing is the testing of a complete and fully integrated software product. Last is acceptance testing, formal testing with respect to user needs, requirements, and business processes conducted to determine whether or not a system satisfies the acceptance criteria and to enable the user 
customers or other authorized entity to determine whether or not to accept the system. That's it from this lecture. Thank you. After test level definition and test objective, now we will focus on test level basis. Let's start with component level. Now we will list down different requirements required for performing component testing. First requirement for component testing is detailed design. Let's see what is detailed design. Software designer writes detailed design in order to give a software development team overall guidance to the architecture of the software project. If this document is available for component testing, it will help the tester to understand how components are placed and which component will be available when and their internal structure. Second requirement is code. Since component testing is done on the smallest unit of the code, Code is one of the necessary requirements for the component testing. One more important point. Component testing is white box type of testing, where code is visible to the tester. Third requirement is data model. In component testing, we validate the component of the software by providing different data, like valid and invalid data to validate if the component behaves as expected. Data model can help in selecting the input data 
and validating it against the expected output. Fourth requirement is component specification. This refers to specific documents that lay out how the component is implemented and its purpose. If the tester knows how the component is implemented, it will help them to write robust component testing test cases. So these were the four requirements we need for component testing. Detail design, code, data model, and component specification. Now, let's move to the integration testing. Here, we have seven requirements which can be useful for integration testing. And let's start with the first one, which is software and system design. Like component testing, here also we need to design document, but instead of detailed design, we go for the software or system design. By seeing this design document, we will come to know how components are connected and how they are interacting with each other. Next one is sequence diagram. Sequence diagram helps tester to understand how data flows through the interfaces. Third one is interface and communication protocol specifications. If in a project any specific protocol is used for sending or receiving data, then specification related to those protocol is required for testing. Fourth requirement for integration testing is use cases. If we know how the interfaces are going to be used by user, then we can prepare better integration test cases. Fifth requirement is architecture at component or system level. Similar to detailed design, architecture provides detailed overview of how components interact with each other, and it is one of the helpful requirements for performing integration testing. Next requirement is workflow. Similar to sequence diagram, workflow lets us know how data flows in a software. Now the last requirement is very important. Apart from the internal interfaces, we must know how software is going to interact with the external interfaces. So all the external interfaces must be defined and provided as an input for the integration testing. So these were the requirements which can be used as an input for integration testing. Software and system design, sequence diagrams, interface and communication protocol specifications, use cases, architecture at component or system level, workflows, and external interface definitions. Now let's move on to system testing requirements. First one is very obvious. We need system and software requirement specification. This is the document which specifies what shall we implement in the software. Using this, tester can write their test cases, which will be used to test which implements are correct or not. Second input is risk analysis report. This report can be used to prioritize the test cases based on the priority features will be selected for testing. Next is use case, epics and user stories. If we know how the system will be used by the user, we can use that information for writing system level test cases. Next is model of system behavior. Most of the time, it is not possible to perform testing on the actual hardware for which software is developed due to high investment costs. So to reduce the costs, the model of the hardware is developed on which system testing is done. Next requirement is state diagram. This provides us the abstract view of different states of the software. Regarding this, we will study in detail in fourth chapter. There, we will see some practical example on it. Last one is system and user manual. An explanation of this is similar to that of use cases. For the system testing, the requirements are system and software requirement specifications, both functional and non-functional, risk analysis reports, use cases, epics and user stories, models of system behavior, state diagrams, 
and system and user manuals. Now let's move to acceptance testing. If you see any high-level document, then you can consider it as a requirement for acceptance testing. For an example, first requirement is business process, user or business requirement. These documents contain high-level requirement. These requirements can be used to see if developed software is as per the expected software or not. Next point is standards. For example, regulations, legal or security standards. These documents are used to see if developed software is as per the standards or not. Next is use cases or user stories. As mentioned before, this document will provide information regarding how user is going to use this software. Next is system requirement or user documentation. This document will provide information regarding how the software shall be implemented. Using this document, we can verify if the implemented software is as per the expected or not. Next requirement is risk analysis report. As mentioned before, this document will help tester to understand which feature is important as per that feature for testing will be selected. Apart from this, there are a few more requirements which act as input for acceptance testing. First one is backup, restore and disaster recovery procedures. This document provides information regarding unusual conditions like what happens if the system crashes. Next one is non-functional requirement. This document provides information like what shall be the response time, stress testing, or maximum load on the system. Next is operations document. Here, we see how the software shall be operated in the normal condition. Fifth point is deployment and installation instruction. This document provides information how software shall be installed and if there is any future software update, how that shall be handled. Sixth point is related to performance targets. This document specifies how the software shall respond. This is also one of the non-functional requirements. Last point is database. If you're working on cloud computing or SQL-related projects, then type of data used by software is mentioned in this document. So these were the different requirements we can get for acceptance testing. Though there are many points here, but to remember, you can categorize them into groups, like requirements it can be business, user, use cases, user stories, or system-level requirements. Second group is standard, like regulations, security, or legal. Third group is installation-related, like recovery, backup, disaster recovery, and installation. Fourth group could be non-functional requirements, like performance target. If you know the objective of the test level, then it will be easy for you to remember these requirements. All the requirements are documented in the single page and attached to this video for your quick revision before the exam. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB Certified Professional. While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. As of now, we cover definitions, objectives, and bases of test level. Now, in this lecture, we will address test level objects. Test object means work product under test. In simple terms, all the items which we can test under the test level is referred to as test object for that test level. And at the end of this lecture, you shall be in a position to differentiate which test object belongs to which test level. Now let's start with the component testing level and see what are the test objects for this level. First test objects are component, unit, module, or code. During definition, we saw this small piece of code and we derive different components out of it. Each of this is referred as component unit or module. And to find out these components, we need code. And these units act as a test object for the component level. Now let's move to the second requirement data structure. A data structure is a particular way of organizing data in a computer so that it can be used effectively. For example, we can store a list of items having the same data type using the array data structure. If we have this information, we can manipulate the data and check how component behaves. Third test object is classes. A class in C++ is the building block that leads to object-oriented programming. It is a user-defined data type which holds its own data members and member functions, which can be assessed and used by creating an instance of that class. And this is the example of class which has keyword, user-defined name and a body. Body consists of data member and member function. In component testing, we can test these data members by changing their values and each of the member function. And the last object is database module. When we work with SQL Server, we work on database modules. One such example is shown here. Like Open Connection is one such database module which establish a connection to a database. So during component testing, we can test this module. So these were the test objects of component testing. Component, unit, modules, code, data structure, classes, and database modules. Now, let's move to integration testing. 
So these are the six test objects under integration testing. Let's start with the first one, subsystem. During objective of testing, we saw this example, and we know that if these three components are part of software, then for integration testing, we need minimum two components to perform integration testing. That is why subsystem is the test object of integration testing. Next test object is database. What is database? Database is a systematic collection of data. Databases support storage and manipulation of data. Database make data management easy. Since data is used to communicate between two components, database is one of the test objects for integration testing. Next is infrastructure. Before going to this, you must know here integration testing refers to component testing and system integration. For system integration testing, the minimum requirement is two subsystems and a communication protocol between them. Therefore, infrastructure and interface are test objects of integration testing. Next is APIs. API is the acronym for Application Programming Interface, which is a software intermediary that allows two applications to talk to each other. That means API is nothing but an interface, and interfaces are test objects of the interface testing. Last one is microservices. Let's understand this object. Microservice is software architecture design pattern in which complex applications are composed of small independent process communicating with each other using language agnostic APIs. These services are small, highly decoupled and focus on doing a small task. So microservices provide interface and interfaces are test object of integration testing. These were the test objects of integration testing subsystems, databases, infrastructure, APIs, and microservices. Now, let's move to the test object of system level. First test object is applications. An application can be hardware or software systems. We saw this picture while defining test levels. During system testing, we get the complete application. Next test object is operating system. To run any software application, we need operating system, which acts as a base. So operating system is test object for system testing. Next one is system under test. It is very obvious that the system we want to test is a test object. Last one is system configuration and configuration data. Configurations in software are used to enable different features for different variant. That means to test different variant of the software, these configuration data are required. That is why system configuration and configuration data are test objects of system testing. So these were the test objects of system testing. Applications, hardware or software system, operating system, system under test, system configuration and configuration data. Now let's see the test objects of acceptance testing. Most of the terms are already explained, so here I will quickly go through them and you need to remember these points. Test objects are system under test, system configuration, and configuration data. Next is business processes for a fully integrated system. Business process is a collection of linked tasks which find their end in the delivery of a service or product to a client. A business process has also been defined as a set of activities and tasks that once completed will accomplish an organizational goal. That is why business process is test object of acceptance testing. Next is recovery system and hot sites. They are used for business continuity and disaster recovery testing. As the name says, this document specifies how systems shall recover during software crash or disaster and hot sites specify how the new updates will be installed. That is why recovery system and hot sites are test objects of acceptance testing. Next is operational and maintenance process. This helps to know how the software shall be used or maintained. Next is forms and reports of testing. And last one is existing and converted production data. All the data collected during production are used as a test object for acceptance testing. 
So these were the test objectives of acceptance testing. System under test, system configuration and configuration data, business processes for a fully integrated system, recovery systems and hot sites for business continuity and disaster recovery testing, operational and maintenance processes, forms, reports, existing and converted production data. Thank you. In this lecture, we will see different types of defects and failures, and you need to remember which defect belongs to which testing level. First testing level is component testing, and these are the three different types of defects we can find here. Incorrect functionality, data flow problem, and incorrect code and logic. First of all, you need to know in component testing, code is available to the tester, and we apply white box testing technique to do it, like statement coverage, decision coverage, and etc. Now let's see an example of it. So this is a piece of code where we are performing statement coverage testing. Now you can see here, piece of the code is available to the tester, and from this we have flowchart, and using that we are testing each statement. While performing statement coverage, we will come to know if code is implemented correctly, data is flowing as expected, or the logic of the code is correct or not. Whenever defect is related to code, it can be logic related or incorrect implementation. Then such defects are found in component testing. So correct functionality, data flow problems and incorrect code, and logic defects are examples of component testing. 
Now, let's move to the integration testing. First one is incorrect data, missing data, or incorrect data encoding. Since during integration testing data is transferred from one module to other module, therefore, while performing integration testing, we can find incorrect data, missing data, or incorrect data encoding. Let's see an example. Suppose there are the two modules where one module is sending data in the character form, whereas other is expecting data in integer form. Then, while performing testing, we can find incorrect data related defects. Next is incorrect sequence or timing of interface calls. Let's understand this with the help of an example. These are the two modules of integration testing. Here, one module is sending data in 100 milliseconds, whereas other is accepting data in 10 milliseconds, and vice versa. Here, the data will be lost since timing is different, and we can find such errors during integration testing. Next is interface mismatch. Let's have a look into the example. Again, we have two modules where one module is sending three data, but other module is only accepting two data. In this case, communication will fail. Next point is also related to this in integration testing, we can find failure in communication between components. Next one is unhandled or improperly handled communication failures between components, as we saw in our last example. Last one is incorrect assumptions about the meaning, units, or boundaries of the data being passed between components. As we saw in the first example where one module was expecting character value, whereas other was looking for integer values. So these were the six examples of defects that can be found during integration testing. Incorrect data, missing data or incorrect data encoding, incorrect sequencing or timing of interface calls, interface mismatch, failures in communication between components, unhandled or improperly handled communication failures between components, incorrect assumptions about the meaning, units, or boundaries of the data being passed between components. Now let's see the example of defects of system testing. First one is incorrect calculation. Since in system testing, we provide input to the system and compare output. For an example, if calculator is our system, then we only give 4 and 6 as input to the system, and if it calculates 11 as output, then we can say system is calculating wrong. Next is incorrect or unexpected system functional or non-functional behavior. If we see an example again, we expect this system to give 10 as output, but if output is 11, then we can say system is not functioning as expected. Therefore, incorrect or unexpected system functional or non-functional behavior is example of system testing. Next is incorrect control and or data flows within the system. If the data flow related issue is not found in the previous testing level, then these types of issues can be found in the system testing. Next is failure to properly and completely carry out end-to-end -end functional tasks. Since we provide input to the system and check the output, with system testing, we perform end-to-end -end testing. Next is failure of the system to work properly in the system environment. During system testing, we test the complete system, so we can find out if the complete system is not working properly in the system environment. Last one is failure of the system to work as described in system and user manuals. This point is similar to first point, where we saw the incorrect calculation. So these were the examples of defects of system testing. Incorrect calculations, incorrect or unexpected system functional or non-functional behavior, incorrect control and or data flows within the system, failure to properly and completely carry out end-to-end -end functional tasks, Failure of the system to work properly in the system environments. Failure of the system to work as described in system and user manuals. Now let's have a look into the example of acceptance testing. First defect is system workflows do not meet business or user requirement. Now if you notice, in acceptance testing, we focus on business requirements. In acceptance testing, we check if built system is as per the business rules or not. All the points we will discuss here will be related to business requirement or standards. Second example is also similar. 
business rules are not implemented correctly. Third example is system does not satisfy contractual or regulatory requirements. Remember this point, contractual or regulatory requirements are verified during acceptance testing. Since now the complete system is available and it is tested from the user point of view, we can find the next defect, that is, non-functional failures, such as security vulnerabilities, inadequate performance efficiency under high loads. And last one is improper operation on a supported platform. Developed system or application will be tested on the supported platform, and then we can find if system is still working fine or not. So these were the examples of defects which we can find during acceptance testing. System workflows do not meet business or user requirements. Business rules are not implemented correctly. System does not satisfy contractual or regulatory requirements. Non-functional failures such as security vulnerabilities, inadequate performance efficiency under high loads, and improper operation on a supported platform.
Now, let's revise all the important points which we discussed till now for test levels. First is test level definitions. During component testing, testing is performed on each individual component separately without integrating with other components. In integration testing, individual software modules are integrated logically and tested as a group. System testing is the testing of a complete and fully integrated software product. Last one is acceptance testing, and it is defined as formal testing with respect to user needs, requirements, and business processes conducted to determine whether or not a system satisfies the acceptance criteria and to enable the user, customer, or other authorized entity to determine whether or not to accept the system. Next is test level objectives. Component testing objectives are reducing risk, verifying whether the functional and non-functional behaviors of the component are as designed and specified, building confidence in the component's quality, finding defects in the component, preventing defects from escaping to higher test levels. Integration testing objectives are reducing risk, Verifying whether the functional and non-functional behaviors of the interfaces are as designed and specified. Building confidence in the quality of the interfaces. Finding defects which may be in the interfaces themselves or within the components or systems. Preventing defects from escaping to higher test levels. System testing objectives are reducing risk. Verifying whether the functional and non-functional behaviors of the system are as designed and specified. Validating that the system is complete and will work as expected. Building confidence in the quality of the system as a whole. Finding defects. And preventing defects from escaping to higher test levels or production. Acceptance testing objectives are Establishing confidence in the quality of the system as a whole. Validating that the system is complete and will work as expected. Verifying that functional and non-functional behaviors of the system are as specified. After test objective, we discussed test basis. Test basis of component testing are Detail design, code, data model, component specifications. Test basis of integration testing are software and system design, sequence diagrams, interface and communication protocol specifications, use cases, architecture at component or system level, workflows, and external interface definitions. Test bases of system testing are system and software requirement specifications, functional and non-functional, risk analysis reports, use cases, epics, and user stories, models of system behavior, state diagrams, system and user manuals. Test bases of acceptance testing are business processes, user or business requirements, regulations, legal contracts and standards, use cases and or user stories, system requirements, system or user documentation, installation procedures, and risk analysis reports. Now, let's see the test level objects. Component testing test objects are components, units or modules, code and data structures, classes, database modules. Integration testing test objects are subsystems, databases, infrastructure, interfaces, APIs, and microservices. System testing test objects are applications, hardware or software systems, operating systems, system under test or SUT, system configuration and configuration data. Acceptance testing test objects are system under test, system configuration and configuration data, business processes for a fully integrated system, recovery systems and hot sites for business continuity and disaster recovery testing, operational and maintenance processes, forms, reports, and existing and converted production data. Last topic is test level defects, and this one is very important. Component testing defects are incorrect functionality, 
for example, not as described in design specifications, data flow problems, and incorrect code and logic. Integration testing defects are incorrect data, missing data, or incorrect data encoding, incorrect sequencing or timing or interface calls, interface mismatch, failures in communication between components, unhandled or improperly handled communication failures between components, incorrect assumptions about the meaning, units, or boundaries of the data being passed between components. System testing defects are incorrect calculations, incorrect or unexpected system functional or non-functional behavior, incorrect control and or data flows within the system, failure to properly and completely carry out end-to-end -end functional tasks, failure of the system to work properly in the system environments, failure of the system to work as described in system and user manuals. Acceptance testing defects are system workflows do not meet business or user requirements, business rules are not implemented correctly, system does not satisfy contractual or regulatory requirements. Non-functional failures such as security vulnerabilities, inadequate performance efficiency under high loads, or improper operation on a supported platform. This was the quick revision of what we discussed till now. Thank you. Till now, we were discussing about test level. Now, we will focus on test types. Under this topic, we have three learning objectives. First objective is compare functional, non-functional, and white box testing, and it is marked as K2. Second learning objective is recognize that functional, non-functional, and white box tests occur at any test level, and it is marked as K1. And last objective is compare the purposes of confirmation testing and regression testing, and it is marked as K2. We will address each of this topic in coming videos, but before that, we will see the overview of test type. Let's see the definition of test type. Test type is a group of test activities aimed at testing specific characteristics of a software system or a part of a system based on specific test objectives. In simple terms, we test the specific characteristic of the software, and depending on which characteristic of the software we test, we classify them into test types. These are the four different test types, and here we will see which type of characteristics are tested under these test types. Here, we are only going to define test types. In the next lecture, we will address each of this topic in detail. First one is functional testing, and in this, we evaluate functional quality characteristics such as completeness, correctness, and appropriateness. Next is non-functional testing, and here, we evaluate non-functional quality characteristics such as reliability, performance efficiency, security, compatibility, and usability. Next is white box testing, where we evaluate whether the structure or architecture of the component or system is correct, complete, and as specified. Last one is change-related testing. In this, we evaluate the effects of changes such as confirming that defects have been fixed and looking for unintended changes in behavior resulting from software or environment changes. As of now, you just need to remember the definition and difference between each test level. In this lecture, we will address functional testing in detail. First, we'll see the functional testing. Functional testing of a system involves tests that evaluate functions that the system should perform. In simple terms, during functional testing, we address what system should do. We get functional testing requirement from these documents. Business requirement specifications, epics, user stories, use cases, and functional specifications. Now, the question comes where we perform functional testing. Functional testing is performed at all test levels. 
Now, let's just understand this point. As we know, functional testing should be performed at all the levels. For an example, if you are at component level, then component specification is your requirement. And if you are at system level, then system specification is your requirement. With the help of these specifications, we perform functional testing. At the end, the key point to remember is focus of testing is different at different levels. Next point is functional testing considers the behavior of the software, and to test the behavior of the system, we use black box testing techniques. At the end of this lecture, we will understand how to calculate functional coverage. Why we need to calculate functional coverage? Because the thoroughness of functional testing can be measured through functional coverage. Functional coverage is calculated by dividing number of test cases tested by total number of test cases and multiplied by 100. Let's see an example of it. Suppose you have total number of requirement equal to 100 and requirement tested is 80. Then functional coverage equals to 80 divided by 100 and multiplied by 100, which equals 80%. That means 80% of the functional requirements are tested. And to perform functional testing, we need special knowledge. We shall have knowledge of particular business problem the software solves. For an example, geological modeling software for the oil and gas industries. In this lecture, we will move to next test type, that is, non-functional testing. Let's first define non-functional testing. Non-functional testing of a system evaluates characteristics of systems and software such as usability, performance efficiency, or security. In simple words, during non-functional testing, we evaluate how well the system behaves. For example, to check how well the software behaves when many people log in to a particular application. Next point is where and when we can perform non-functional testing. We can perform it at all test levels, and the late discovery of non-functional defects can be extremely dangerous to the success of a project. Similar to functional testing, the behavior of the software in non-functional testing is tested using black box testing technique. For example, boundary value analysis can be used to define the stress conditions for performance tests. At the end of this lecture, we will understand how to calculate non-functional coverage. Why we need to calculate non-functional coverage? Because the thoroughness of functional testing can be measured through non-functional coverage. Non-functional coverage is calculated by dividing number of test cases tested by total number of test cases and multiplied by 100. Let's see an example of it. Suppose you have total number of requirements equal to 100 and requirement tested is 80. The non-functional coverage equals to 80 divided by 100 and multiplied by 100, which equals 80%. That means 80% of the non-functional requirements are tested. And to perform non-functional testing, we need special knowledge. We need knowledge of inherent weakness of a design or technology. For an example, security vulnerabilities associated with particular programming languages. Along with weakness, we also need knowledge of particular user base. For an example, the personas of users of healthcare facility management systems. In this lecture, we will address third test type, that is white box testing. Let's see the overview of white box testing. White box testing derives tests based on the system's internal structure or implementation. Internal structure may include code, architecture, workflows, 
and or data flows within the system. What you need to understand here is during white box testing, code is available to the tester. And there are different types of white box testing, which we will discuss in detail in Chapter 4. Now, the question comes, where can we perform white box testing? It is performed at component or component integration testing, because code is available at this level. Next question is how to measure white box testing. This is done by measuring structural coverage. Let's understand what is structural coverage. Structural coverage is the extent to which some type of structural element has been exercised by tests and is expressed as a percentage of the type of element being covered. Here we have one word, structural element. Structural element is referred to statements in the code and decisions on the code. If you have this as an example, then this is called statement and this is called decision. In white box testing, we can calculate coverage for component testing or component integration testing. The coverage for component testing is calculated by dividing number of component code tested by total number of components multiplied by 100. The coverage for component integration testing is calculated by dividing number of tested by total number and multiplied by 100. Performing white box testing also requires special knowledge, such as the way the code is built, how data is stored, for example, to evaluate possible database queries, and how to use coverage tools and to correctly interpret their results. This is all about white box testing. Thank you. Finally, we will see the last test type, that is, change-related testing. First, we will understand what is change-related testing. When changes are made to a system, either to correct a defect or because of new or changing functionality, testing should be done to confirm that the changes have corrected the defect or implemented the functionality correctly and have not caused any unforeseen adverse consequences. Now, in simple terms, understand how changes are introduced in software. There are two ways we can introduce changes to the software. First is due to defects found in the software, or if there is new requirement for next release. Change-related testing are of two types, confirmation testing and regression testing. Let's understand confirmation testing. Suppose you have a software with version 1.0, and while testing this software, Test case 1 was executed and we found defect on it. Now, this software will be sent to developer so that developer can fix it. Once the defect is fixed, new version of the software is ready, which is referred here as software version 2.0, where defect is fixed. Now, important point here is we must run test case once again to confirm defect is fixed. This is why this change related is called confirmation testing because we used the same test case to confirm if found defect is fixed or not. Now, let's see the technical definition of confirmation testing. After a defect is fixed, the software may be tested with all test cases that failed due to the defect, which should be re-executed on the new software version. The software may also be tested with new tests. Re-execute the test which found defect. Now, we will understand regression testing. Suppose there is a software with three software components. Component 1, Component 2, and Component 3. To test Component 1, Test Case 1 is used. To test Component 2, Test Case 2 is used. And to test Component 3, Test Case 3 is used. Now consider, if you get new requirement and due to that component 2 is changed, in that case it is very obvious that we have to test component 2 because it is changed. But now the question is, is executing test case 2 enough? And the answer is no, because the change the component 2 can impact component 1 or component 3, since they are connected with each other. Therefore, along with test case 2, we have to run test case 1 
and test case 3. Now, let's see the technical definition of regression testing. It is possible that a change made in one part of the code, whether a fix or another type of change, may accidentally affect the behavior of other parts of the code. Changes may include changes to the environment, new version of an operating system, database management system. Next question is what is the purpose of confirmation testing and regression testing? The purpose of a confirmation test is to confirm whether the original defect has been successfully fixed. And the purpose of regression testing involves running tests to detect unintended side effects. Similar to other test types, we must know where we perform change-related testing. Change-related testing is performed at all test levels. It is effective at iterative and incremental development lifecycle, for an example, Agile project. With this, the topic ends. To remember the important points of test type, let's revise all the points. Here, I will only go through the points quickly. First, we saw the definition of functional testing. Functional testing of a system involves tests that evaluate functions that the system should perform. Next is non-functional testing. Non-functional testing of a system evaluates characteristics of systems and software such as usability, performance efficiency, or security. Third test type is white box testing. White box testing derives tests based on the system's internal structure or implementation. And fourth type is change-related testing. When changes are made to a system, either to correct a defect or because of new or changing functionality, testing should be done to confirm that the changes have corrected the defect or implemented the functionality correctly and have not caused any unforeseen adverse consequences. Then there are some questions we address in each test type. In functional testing, we ask what the system should do. In non-functional testing, we ask how well the system behaves. In white box testing, we ask, is code implementation correct? In change-related testing, we ask, are changes implemented correctly? Now, let's see the requirements for test types. For functional testing, we need work products such as business requirement specifications, epics, user stories, use cases, or functional specifications, or they may be undocumented. For non-functional testing, we need same work product. Work products such as business requirement specifications, epics, user stories, use cases, or functional specifications, or they may be undocumented. For white box testing, we need internal structure, which includes code, architecture, workflows, and or data flows within the system. For change-related testing, we need bug report and new change feature. Now, let's see where we perform these test types. Functional testing can be performed at all test levels. Non-functional testing is also performed at all test levels. And what we need to know is the late discovery of non-functional defects can be extremely dangerous to the success of a project. White box testing is performed at component level and component integration level. Change-related testing is also performed at all test levels. Now, recall how to calculate coverage criteria for different test types. Functional testing coverage is calculated by number of functional requirements tested by total number of functional requirements multiplied by 100. Non-functional testing coverage is calculated by number of non-functional requirement tested by total number of non-functional requirement multiplied by 100. Under white box testing, Component testing coverage is calculated by number of component code tested by total number of components multiplied by 100. And component integration testing coverage 
is calculated by number of interfaces tested by total number of interface multiplied by 100. Last topic is change-related testing, which is of two types, confirmation testing and regression testing. Confirmation testing, where we run the test case to confirm that the defect is fixed or not. And then regression testing, where we check there is no side effect on other components due to change in some components. And the last topic of this session is which type of knowledge is required to perform these testings. To start with functional testing, we shall have knowledge of particular business problem the software solves. For an example, geological modeling software for the oil and gas industries. For non-functional testing, we need knowledge of inherent weaknesses of a design or technology. For an example, security vulnerabilities associated with particular programming languages. Along with weaknesses, we also need knowledge of particular user base. For an example, the personas of users of healthcare facility management systems. This was the complete revision of test type topic. Thank you. Hi, this is the last topic of this chapter, maintenance testing. In this topic, there are two learning objectives. First, we need to summarize triggers for maintenance testing. And second topic is, describe the role of impact analysis in maintenance testing. And both are marked as K2. So you need to understand these topics. First, we will define maintenance testing. Testing the changes to an operational system or the impact of a changed environment to an operational system, which means there is a possibility that the system we developed will undergo change or it is also possible that the environment in which our system is working is changed. In both these cases, we need maintenance testing. Now let's understand the definition in detail. Suppose you are a developer and you develop an application and you delivered this software for operational use. Now while the application was in operation, people found defect on it or the customer wants some change in the existing functionality or they want to add new feature to meet market competition or there is also a possibility that the environment on which the application was working is changed. In any of these cases, software will undergo changes, and due to this change, we need to perform testing. Such testing is called maintenance testing. Along with the functional testing, maintenance testing also needs to check non-functional quality characteristics, like performance efficiency, compatibility, reliability, security, and portability. Now the question arises, where we can perform maintenance testing? Similar to other test types, we can perform maintenance testing at all test levels. The last topic over here is the scope of maintenance testing. And the scope of maintenance testing depends upon the degree of risk of the change, for example, the degree to which the changed area of software communicates with other components or systems. That means the effort of maintenance testing depends on the amount of code changed and risk associated with that. Next is the size of the existing system. Because the more bigger the system, the effort required to perform regression testing under maintenance testing. Last one, is size of the code. The more you change the code after production, the more effort you have to put for performing maintenance testing. Hello and welcome to the ISTQB Foundation Level Training and Certification Program. Single solution for your preparation. This accredited course is going to teach you each and everything you need to know to become a successful ISTQB Certified Professional. 
While other courses only cover the theoretical concepts, our course not only covers these theoretical concepts, but also covers real-time examples. In addition, we make sure you remember the topics by providing revisions, quizzes, and different exercises. The highlight of this course is that it contains topic-wise explanation, topic-wise quizzes, chapter-wise quizzes, 11 question papers from 2017 to 2020, two practice sets to practice before you attend the exam. In total, you will get more than 1,500 questions, which is enough to clear the real ISTQB exam. Our courses are not developed by just one person, but a special team of highly qualified professionals and experienced educators who are working in the leading industries. This includes subject matter experts to help you with technical topics, trained voiceover artists to make sure you get a great audio learning experience, and experienced graphic designer to enhance the visualization. We have a wide experience in teaching online and we have more than 30 popular courses listed in online platform for different certifications. It is our genuine pleasure to use all our experience and expertise to train you and help you obtain an official ISTQB certification. As of now, we are teaching in 143 countries with more than 1 lakh students and still growing. Now it's your turn to join our growing family and become part of it. In return, you will get advice from industry experts who will help you throughout the course. Join ISTQB Foundation Level Training by enrolling now and become part of us. There is no need to worry. This course is backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee. You got nothing to lose. Let's get you ISTQB certified. In this lecture, we will see what are the triggers for maintenance. This will address the first objective of maintenance testing, where we will summarize triggers for maintenance testing. First point is maintenance testing is done for both planned and unplanned changes. In the last lecture, we saw some of the reasons of software change, like defect fix, change or new requirement, and environment change. When we say plan changes, we mean changed due to defect fix, feature enhancement, or etc. And unplanned changes are due to external impact on the application. For example, law of the land changed. Triggers for maintenance testing are of two types, modification and migration. When we say change is due to modification, it refers to planned enhancements. Examples of planned enhancements are corrective and emergency changes, changes of the operational environment, such as planned operating system or database upgrades, and upgrades of COTS software and patches for defects and vulnerabilities. Next is change due to migration. An example of it is platform change. Let's first see an example and then we will go through these points. Suppose you have a platform with version 1.0, an application with 5.6 version, and there is a data communication between them. Now, if the platform changes from 1.0 to 2.0, this may impact data communication with application. And to solve this, we have to change application so that we establish an effective communication again. Now let's go through the points. We saw in the example that if the platform on which application runs changes, then application will also undergo changes. And that's why we need operational tests of the new environment, as well as of the changed software. This also includes tests of data conversion when data from another application will be migrated into the system being maintained. At the end of this lecture, we will see reasons of migration. I will just go through the points as they are self-explanatory. Retirement, such as when an application reaches the end of its life. When an application or system is retired, this can require testing of data migration or archiving 
if long data retention periods are required. Testing, restore, or retrieve procedures after archiving for long retention periods may also be needed. Regression testing may be needed to ensure that any functionality that remains in service still works. In this lecture, we will address the last topic of this chapter, that is, impact analysis for maintenance. And here, we will see the second learning objective, describe the role of impact analysis in maintenance testing, and it is marked as K2. Let's first see why we do impact analysis in maintenance testing. Impact analysis may be done before a change is made to help decide if the change should be made based on the potential consequences in other areas of the system. What you need to understand here is we do impact analysis before we change code to see what is the consequences of it on system. Next question is why we do impact analysis. Impact analysis evaluates to identify the intended consequences as well as expected and possible side effects of a change. Second point is the areas in the system that will be affected by the change. And third point is impact of a change on existing tests. Remember these three points. Expected and possible side effect of a change, impact on system, and impact on existing tests. Though impact analysis is very useful for the success of the maintenance activity, but it is difficult to perform impact analysis if Specifications are outdated. You know that specifications are the main input to know the requirements. If specification itself is not available, or if it is not updated, then it is very difficult to know what is implemented and what will be the impact of change on the system. Similar to this is a second point. Test cases are not documented or are out of date. Since impact analysis identifies the impact on existing tests, but if the test itself is not updated, how one can analyze it? Third point is bidirectional traceability between tests and the test basis has not been maintained. Let's understand this. If each of the requirements has linked to test cases, then if requirements are changed, then we know that linked test cases need update and shall be executed. But if there is no link between requirement and test case, then we cannot evaluate how many test cases shall be changed. Fourth point is very simple. Tool support is weak or non-existent, and the people involved do not have domain and or system knowledge. Suppose if you have maintained the system after 10 years, then there are no tool and you need to put manual effort. That time, it will be very difficult for anyone to complete the task, especially if they don't have domain knowledge. Last point is insufficient attention has been paid to the software's maintainability during development. For example, while writing the code, comments were not added. In that case, after a long time, it will be difficult to understand the functionality of the code. With this, the chapter ends. Thank you.